15 seconds. Out of the gates, ready to go. Outkick 360 underway from Radio Row at Super Bowl 56, live in Los Angeles with Chad Withrow and Paul Koharski. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Big show today. Clay Travis is on later this hour. We will talk with Fox Executive Vice President Ed Hartman in about 20 minutes. John McClain is on the show as well. He'll kick off hour number two. And Andrew Perloff, formerly of the Dan Patrick Show. You know him as McLovin. He's on the show today uh, in hour number two, plus many more guests to come. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. All shows are big, but they're even bigger when you're at the Super Bowl in L.A. The buzz is growing in this uh, cavernous room. More people are showing up, walking around. Um, and we look forward to talking to many of those uh, those high-profile people. Um, the the, the profile has grown. Yesterday, it, people hadn't gotten to L.A. It's the build. It's the build of the game. It's a slow uh, build. People are starting to roll in from Vegas in the Pro Bowl, and uh, some other players uh, will, will arrive later this week. Our coverage uh, across Outkick.com and across the Outkick network, uh, and everyone, uh, if you're watching, if you're tuned in on the radio network, we appreciate you there. You can hit us on Twitter at Outkick360. It's not really Radio Row until you see – some goofy radio host from one of the home markets in a home jersey. And we've got a guy in a Bengals jersey. <laughs> so uh, well, we got we to reach e a don't, certain level. Don't exclude your part of the country also. We've got a guy in an Eagles jersey also well, that's walking just around. Dumb. In, uh, I mean, the Eagles aren't Row. in the game. So it's, uh, I mean, it's even dumber. 
Yeah, it's super silly to wear a jersey of a team that's not in the market. You know a lot of Cincinnati radio stations are going to be here, and obviously a lot of Los Angeles radio stations in their home. They didn't have to shell out a lot of money to come here if you're an L.A. station. For Bengals, uh, for Cincinnati radio stations, you know, it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime, perhaps, uh, event for a lot of those broadcasters. And one of them sees fit to wear a... uh, a Bengals jersey, the orange one, not the black one that they'll be wearing on Sunday. I, I'm, I'm sure their fans love it. The I, fans of that show and fans of the Bengals just love him in a jersey. So I'm that's intrigued why to see it. as we as we get uh, some people rolling in here from Cincinnati. They had the send off yesterday for the Bengals. Um, the, Willie their, Anderson was telling us about it. And then they flew this morning. They're arriving in L.A. It should be around this time. And I, I'm I'm curious to know how many fans they're bringing to this game. I am too. I, I think it will be co- quite a lot. Yeah. It's funny when I looked at that first itinerary and I saw when Cincinnati was getting here, I was wondering why there wasn't a, an arrival for the Rams on there. That's how dumb dumb I am and how how conditioned I am to to how the Super Bowl works. May I, may I be negative for a moment? Sure. If is that if that's okay with you guys? Um, pardon my negativity. Uh, Cincinnati is arriving historically late for a Super Bowl. Is it because they're so cheap? No, 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 no. It's because of COVID. It's because the league wants it that way. The league would have preferred them to show up on Thursday or Friday, Chad. Yep. They're really? actually showing up okay. earlier at the behest. I, I just, I just of saw Zach that they're Taylor. they're showing up later than any team before, and I immediately thought, oh, it's because they're no. cheap. Last year, the 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 um, the visitors the, uh, showed up late Thursday or Friday. I think maybe even Saturday. I think Friday. Visitors would have been the Chiefs. Yeah, COVID, a COVID um, situation. Well, completely they, driven they sent by. out an email, or like right before the the playoffs, probably three or four weeks before the playoffs, letting teams know the protocol. And it just so happens that the Rams are here. They wanted the league. Chad wanted those teams to have regular practice weeks at home, pretty much, and yep. then come. Uh, Zach Taylor wanted them to to do the traditional thing where you you put in your game plan you do virtually everything last week then you come here on a regular week and it's a brush up week pretty much and that's what th- they've done coming on a Tuesday then they have Wednesday Thursday Friday standard here so th- we're going to uh, hit some news of the day real quick uh, as we get set to be joined by Ed Hartman from from Fox and the USFL um, and it's got it's, it starts with Brady and I feel like we're going to have news with him every week to begin a Tuesday because he has the Let's Go podcast with Jim Gray and Tom Brady on Mondays that drop. But it it, it took a week. It took a week of the retirement before we actually have a quote from Tom Brady that makes it seem like he's not all the way in to retirement. It sounds like never say never. Yeah, it sounds like, and it's more than just say never say never. you know, this, this to me, you know, whenever we said, well, it feels like Brady could retire based on what he's saying. This feels like he's open to the idea of coming back as soon as he gets the itch, and we know he will. We, Tom Brady will want to play again. That's well, why I, I'm, I'm confused as to why he did it so quickly because I think the itch in a standard NFL player, and he's not a standard NFL player, but I think we've talked about this. Most players feel like they don't want to play anymore in January. But in April, they feel differently. It seems his clock was sped up by the reports. Yes. And by his I, don't, I don't think he was completely ready to announce any decision, and then those reports get out, m- maybe because of an episode that was seen of Man in the Arena or whatever, but he didn't want to commit to it that early. He did a couple days later, and now it's, it's, it's not just the never say never. It's I don't know how I'll feel in six months. I'm okay with the decision right now, but I'm taking things day to day. Sounds like a non-decision when it's framed like that, right? I, I mean, I, I'm with Hutton on this. If that if he's already saying that and planting that seed, one week. Do we think that Tom Brady's going to get closer to training camp and an NFL season, feeling good physically and not want to go play quarterback? Wouldn't spend too much money if I'm the Bucks on quarterback. Well, they don't have much money to spend as it is. <laughs> yeah, um, and that, that's options. one of the issues with him and Rodgers. Both of their teams are going to have to make some roster decisions. Um, and, and look, it, Brady's quote, he says he's retired. But he also says, I'm just going to be as honest as I can be and take things in the moment. And he, he uses the phrase, never say never. Uh, he goes, I, I don't think it's, it's looking to reverse course. I'm definitely not, not looking to do that. But at the same time, I think you have to be realistic 
that you never know what challenges are, uh, are going to be there in life. Again, I loved playing. I'm looking forward to doing things other than playing. That's as honest as I can be. And he started that answer by saying, I try, not, I, I try to make the best possible decision I can in the moment, which I did last week. And, and he, he later says, I think that's the best way to put it. I'm just going to take things as they come. I'll fill it out six months from now. In the moment. He's kind of, I, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, Chad. That he was forced to make the decision in the moment. By the reports, which is unlike him to kind of let somebody for nobody force a baby into a corner. Um, well, the reports were accurate. Coming, yeah, uh, it's coming. not just that they reported it; it's that they they said he was going to retire, and he retired. Like he but, was thinking but about his this initial well resistance the to out. the reports was I'm the I I'm what were the initial things were uh, you know I'm on my own timetable all of that stuff he was resistant then all of a sudden. He came out and, and confirmed all that stuff. A week ago today. Yeah. I don't know. The way that sounds to me brings back all of my doubts. Well, want to play till I'm 45, you know, um, my body will tell me, all, all of that stuff uh, that, that kind of evaporated. The same way I felt when he had that comment about there comes a time when I have to, you know, be there and be a family man and husband and devote more of my time to that. When I read that quote, I thought, he's retiring. When I saw this quote, I thought, he's not retired. He's coming back. Well, let's see how I feel in six and months. The, and the other thing that I think a lot of – he wasn't saying this, but a lot of people were saying this, the idea that uh, you know the Bucks won't be as good. They won't be as good. But Tom Brady, to me, isn't a guy that says, well, you know, we're not going to have it. He, he went into a lot of seasons with New England with the team that was a lot less than it was the year before. And what does Tom Brady do? Tom Brady, we've talked about this on guys who don't do it. What Tom Brady does is elevates people, you know, and they're not going to have everybody back. But they had everybody back this well, year. It didn't well, work to, out. To an day. extent, though, I, I also don't think he wants to be a part of a rebuild. No. If he feels but like he's got a shot, a if he feels like he's got any shot to win a Super Bowl, he's willing to go compete for that Super Bowl. But he's also not going to come back for the spirit of the game no. and just to play but that's not on a, any team. That's not a particularly scary division, and I think they can put together a roster that will compete. It won't be as good as last year's roster. It's a playoff team. Yes. And if you're in the playoffs, you got a shot. got a shot. And if you have well, Tom Brady as your quarterback in the playoffs, you definitely have a shot. Why does it have to be Tampa Bay? Well, he's on the contract. Well, but again, like he, if he wants to go play for another team, they'll trade his rights. Yeah, could. No, I agree with that. I, I'm presuming Tampa Bay because he's under contract. Why, Can you if, imagine if, if off season? If he came back and said, uh, you know, and under the situation, Tampa Bay would be out of playoff consideration or whatever it might be. If he said, "I'm coming back," by then they've already made the decision to trade his rights to San Francisco or somewhere out west, where wherever he's been rumored. Tennessee, where he's got a, a good friend who's the coach. That's another Ryan Tannehill money issue uh, deal. But it's a, it's a team that, uh, you know, certainly was in his first group of teams. I'm intrigued by this. Because San Francisco's got Trey Lance. All these teams is, uh, have done something else in the meantime. You know, th- this has gone back even in the, the 2019 season, the, the wild card loss where the, the Titans lost in Foxborough. He was getting th- – there was discussion then about Giselle wanting him to retire. And the same thing has happened every offseason throughout this entire process. And it was happening even before the 2019 season. Point being, this is all about the family, right? This, th- he made this decision, and I, I've, I've joked, but it's also true. I'll, I'll believe he's not retired whenever she says it. Well, you know, and, he, and that's, I think that's why he did what he did. Here's now. one of the things, too, that weighs into your idea of a different team. One of the things he did seemingly for her and the family as he got older, was gave up off seasons with the team, right? He stopped showing up for OTAs yeah. and all of that, and took spring and summer to be with his family. And he did his own thing, which obviously worked out just fine. Well, it's harder to do your own thing if you're with a new team. You need to be there he, in Tampa Bay the first year. What was he doing? He was arranging versus yeah. the COVID protocols get-togethers at some yeah, he, private school. And everything. he went and rented Derek Jeter's house. If he it, changes teams now, if he changes teams now, he's going to need to do spring football. If he stays with Tampa Bay, he probably doesn't need to do as much. Let's just take a second and admire the possibility of an offseason where Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, and Tom Brady are all publicly asking for a trade. And every team out there that feels like they are a a star quarterback away from a Super Bowl, the Tennessee Titans included, who should absolutely be talking to Green Bay or Seattle if those guys ask, ask for a trade. Can you imagine 
the speculation in every NFL market that's in that situation to possibly trade for one of those three guys. New Orleans, Pittsburgh, in, in Pittsburgh's a, not with a do league it, that that dominates the entire year calendar year already. Yep. That's even more dominating now has this baseball like hot stove. It would be like, to amazing. The extreme. Uh, baseball has been left in the I mean baseball no, I hot stove has nothing but, on free agency but in the NFL. In its prime, baseball yeah. hot stove would be was incredible. a season into itself that the NFL now has uh, if it has those quarterbacks on it would be like the best baseball hot stove in history. Clay Travis will join us in 30 minutes when we come back. Executive Vice President for Fox uh, and for the USFL. Ed Hartman is about to join us. As we broadcast in L.A., we'll discuss the, the league that starts up this coming spring in Birmingham. Eight teams and all the info you need to know about and the business behind it. Why now? Why does it make sense? And we'll get Ed's take on the success of the league and how we should judge it this coming spring. That's all straight ahead on Outkick 360.
From Los Angeles, Outkick 360 rolls on. We're live on Radio Row at Super Bowl 56. The crew is all here. Everyone behind the scenes with Outkick and Fox making it happen for us. Clay Travis joins us coming up in about 25 minutes from now. Looking forward to that chat, plus John McClain and much more. Right now, we say hello to Ed Hartman. He is the executive vice president of the USFL and uh, VP for Fox. And uh, he's joining us uh, across uh, the city here, here in Los Angeles. Ed, uh, great to have you on the show for the first time. Hope things are well. Great to uh, be on. Thanks for having me. And I think last time I saw you all was uh, in Knoxville for the Bowling Green game a few months ago, which was a lot of fun. So good to be uh, back in touch. Absolutely. Uh, I, let's, let's start with the USFL. Um, you are the executive vice president of the league, and everything gets going in just a couple of months, April 16th, that weekend. Um, are things moving way too fast right now as you look at the calendar and think about everything that needs to be done for the league as we get set to kick off the, the USFL? Listen, we're excited. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, and there has been for many months. Um, we've made a number of exciting announcements over the last, uh, last few months. There's, you can rest assured many more to come in the, in the coming weeks and months uh, uh, through to kick off. But, look, it's a, a lot of work starting a new, uh, a new football league, but um, we're very confident with uh, what we're building and very excited about the kickoff on April 16th. We saw uh, ill-timed attempts by the Alliance and the XFL uh, resurrection. Pandemic obviously had a lot to, to, to say about what went on there. How much did you guys look at, at what they did, what they didn't do? What were the lessons learned from, from their attempts? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Paul. There's a number of learnings that we're leaning on as we build out this league, um, you know, based on the past experience of those leagues you mentioned. Um, I think, firstly, it's a it's a misconception that the XFL was a, a failure last time around. You know, the ratings of the XFL in the three weeks that it um, uh, was around for before COVID were actually exceptional. There was outrage in the NBA for those three weeks. And so based on that and based on other research we've done, we're very, very confident that there is a strong demand for additional football in the spring. Um, I think the lessons that we've learned uh, from previous leagues is that, you know, you need to keep your costs in check. And to that end, we are utilizing a hub model for the first uh, one to three years in Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama. And that enables us to keep, you know, costs in check and, and that side of things under control. Um, we have, you know, we think the best uh, broadcast partners of any startup league in history in Fox and NBC. We have the best um, broadcast exposure, uh, free web broadcast exposure of any league period in the spring um, with over half the games being on a free to air broadcast television and the other half being on uh, fully distributed cable um, and we have you know what we think is the the best promotion of the league via both fox and nbc so um you know keeping the cost in check using the hub model um having the the broad support of fox behind us uh, and the media exposure that we have we think it's a recipe for success well, Annette, I'm, I'm loving the promos of uh, need more football, you know, question mark uh, that you guys had. The one with the clash with the NASCAR event uh, that aired there. I, I love seeing that. And it's such a simple premise of football is king in the United States. And I don't know if we could ever have enough. Was that the basis for this idea about reviving the USFL of, hey, instead of just saying the NFL has all of it, Let's explore a market outside of the NFL season because people want football ultimately. That's absolutely right. I mean, as I said, from previous leagues, we've seen that this uh, extra football will definitely rate on television in the, um, in the springtime. Um, there's a massive amount of talent out there in, in this country that wants to play professional football. It's good enough to play professional football that might not necessarily make the NFL for any number of reasons. And so those two things combined lead us to believe that this is a product that's really going to resonate. Ed, how will betting, sports betting, fit in with this league as we kick things off in a couple months? It's a great question, and it's another kind of key part of our of our thesis to building this out. Um, you know, if you look at the initial teams that we've uh, that we've picked um, out of all the USFL teams that we um, IP that we uh, that we um, own, it's no fluke that over half of those teams, are, you know, in legal uh, or have names that are, that are based in legal betting states. Um, you know, you've seen. Um, so far as betting's rolled out in the United States that something like 60 or 70% of all user acquisition happens during football season. 
And so we think by extending that, you know, football uh, um, uh, window, um, you'll get significant interest from from bettors. And, and it's fair to say that we've had a lot of inbound from um, all the leading betting companies wanting to be involved in different ways uh, with the league, either by making markets or, or by being aligned in some other ways. So, um, as I said, it's very clear that Americans love betting on on football. And so providing an extra 10 or 12 weeks of football to bet on, we think, again, is a winning strategy. Ed Hartman, our guest, he's the executive vice president for the USFL and a VP for Fox as well. And the USFL kicks off in April on Fox and NBC. Ed, whenever the league got going and you're in these meetings trying to brainstorm coaches that will lead, the, uh, lead these teams and everyone's playing in Birmingham, which we'll, we'll hit on in just a moment, who did, you, who did you think of first? Where do you start when trying to get the coaches to join the league and give you that exposure? Yeah, so thankfully we've got a, a wonderful team of football experts um, that have been working on that since the, the start, you know, including Brian Woods and Daryl Johnson. And then obviously, you know, Fox has any number of uh, football luminaries uh, amongst our, our staff and talent. And so that um, that brain trust has been going to work for many months, you know, coming up with, with suitable candidates uh, to fill up the eight spots. And you've obviously seen all eight now announced. Um, uh, you, I, I believe you've got Jeff, Jeff Fisher on the show um, coming up this week as well, um, who's one of them. And so, look, based on the expertise of that, some of those folks that I mentioned, we picked, we think, eight outstanding coaches, and they're all super excited to be coaching uh, this spring. I'm interested in the controlled environment of, of Birmingham, you know, having all of the games in one spot. I mean, we've seen, you know, chaos uh, with a pandemic and things that can arise with that. But in terms of a startup, being that controlled and having all games in one spot i guess a two-part question why birmingham and what kind of advantages does that give you in season one of usfl yeah um listen birmingham uh the city has been absolutely fantastic to work work with we had an event down there at protective stadium a couple of weeks ago to announce birmingham as a host city um, you know, way back mid last year, um, the city reached out when they, you know, heard that we were thinking about starting this league to see if they might uh, be able to host us. And um, and since then, there's been obviously wide ranging discussions about how the deal might look like, and ultimately, um, the deal that was um, that was inked. But um, look, we, they've got a brand new uh, stadium there in downtown called Protective Stadium, which is a magnificent new facility. Um, there's you know hotel facilities right across the road where players and league staffs will be staying. Um, so a magnificent complex to host us and looks fantastic on television as well. Um, and look, they've been they've been great. And, and obviously that area of the world, where, which is not far from where you're, you're all are based, loves football and there's a very, very strong demand for football there. And so, you know, those ingredients make Birmingham, we think, the perfect um, location to host our, uh, our, um, our league. Um, from a, a tactical perspective, we think that having a hub um, to start with, you know, makes things a lot easier. Um, obviously, there's a lot less organisation that goes on with everything being centralised. Um, as you may or may not be aware, you know, Fox owns the league and all the teams. And so having that centralised model, um, I mentioned earlier, helps keeping keep costs down. It just makes organisation that whole, whole lot easier than being in disparate markets initially. How important to to try to get the the New Jersey Generals connected to New Jersey while you're in Birmingham to get the the Pittsburgh Maulers connected to Pittsburgh and so on with your franchises and how will you attempt to do that? It's a great question, um, Paul. You know, and it's something that we're laser focused on. I think you know part of the brilliance of um, of, of Eric Shanks and Brian Woods acquiring the the USFL IP um, was that there is incredible a nostalgic equity value in the, in these marks. You know, the amount of folks that have come out of the woodwork on social and elsewhere who went to USFL games 30 years ago and now want to take their kids 30 years later um, has been quite incredible. And you've seen that in the massive social following we've been able to amass in a, a short period of time. And so we think we've got, you know, a big tailwind given that IP has so much latent equity value in it. Um, on top of that, obviously Fox has... Um, owned and operated television station and affiliates in, in many, if not all, these markets. And so using those local television stations to help activate um, local fans is, is going to be one weapon we use as well, on top of the IP. Um, but look, it's something we're super focused on. We think um, the combination of those two things and some other tactics will make it possible to build out the, 
the local following, despite the fact that teams are playing in, in one market, uh, at least for the first year. You mentioned the, the great TV partnership uh, with, with Fox and NBC. How did the, the simulcast of the opener come together? That's something uh, we were, when we first saw it, we were talking about what a rarity that is. Uh, and you have to go as far as we could remember, but way back in history to find examples of uh, sporting events being shared and aired at the same time by rival networks. Yeah, it's a historic event, and, um, you know, it really goes again to the, the brilliance of, of Eric Shanks, our, our CEO of Fox Sports and the chairman of the USFL, who just thought that, you know, one of the best possible ways to blow up this event as, as best we can is to put it on two networks. And so thanks to the, to the partnership of NBC, um, and, and thanks to Eric's idea, it's happening, and it's, it's going to be an incredible, you know, historic um, event that evening on April 16th. Ed Hartman, our guest, Executive Vice President for the USFL and with Fox. Ed, so uh, let's see. Tickets are very inexpensive, very affordable for the family. If anyone's in the Birmingham area in the southern region of the United States, what, 10 bucks is what I was reading, and there's eight teams I believe you'll be playing games on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as the season gets rolling. Give us kind of the logistics for fans who want to take in the product in person. Yeah, so our goal is to be, you know, the most family-friendly league um, in the country. And, and to that end, as you mentioned, tickets are very affordable. Tickets are on sale now for our opening game. It's $10 for adults. Uh, every adult can bring three kids under 15 for free. Um, and so I, I can't think of any entertainment that rivals that in terms of affordability. Um, if you go to www.theusfl.com, there's a link to tickets there that you can buy. Um, tickets for the rest of the season will go on sale uh, uh, in the coming weeks. And so for folks that want to come to that opening game, as I said, it's a very, very cheap ticket. We want to make it family friendly and affordable. And so go and buy tickets now and come on down on April 16th. And some big rollouts on merch, too, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll uh, be um, making some you know, big announcements around merch in the coming weeks and expect to see some really fantastic items going on sale again via that website, www.usfl.com. Ed, you wear a lot of hats and you've worn a lot of hats throughout your career. Uh, I'm curious, uh, one of those hats was, was working in mergers and acquisitions at one point. Obviously, we're very interested in this now uh, <laughs> with Fox <laughs> owning OutKick. Um, we love business strategy type things, big philosophical discussions. In terms of mergers and acquisitions, when a Fox Corp looks into OutKick or TMZ, for instance, when things like this happen, how much thought goes into it? When you're looking at valuation, when you're looking at cultural fit, everything else, I, I, I'm just mesmerized by the team of people that, that work on that and how much thought goes into a big purchase like that. Yeah, well, I can speak specifically to OutKick because I uh, helped uh, work on the team that, that made that acquisition. And obviously, it's one we were super excited about at the time and still super excited uh, about now. Um, but look, a lot of work goes into all these deals. Um, by virtue of, of who Fox is, we see a lot of things come across our desks um, and, and pass on, on most. But the ones that, that make the grade, you know, clearly we have to be very excited about for a number of reasons. Um, specific to OutKick, it was a kind of incredible opportunity to invest in a company that was at the intersection of uh, news, sports, pop culture, um, and wagering, which, you know, are all obviously major strategic focuses of Fox. And so it's not often that you get things that come along the desk that that, um, that line up like that, like OutKick did, and then also line up on price, but um, it did. And, and obviously we, we went ahead with the deal and we're incredibly excited to be partnered with, uh, with OutKick and Clay and, and you all. And so, um, it's been a great one, and similar with TMZ, you know, um, it, it ticked a lot of boxes and and uh, was able to line up on, uh, on financially and on price, and so and so made the grade. But look, as I said, we look at a lot of things, and not everything makes the cut. But those that do, we think are exceptional and need to be exceptional to do so. You know, when I see the the excitement around sports wagering, online sports wagering, and the the amount of things that go into that. I'm always amazed when I look up and see it's still a very small minority of United States that actually have online sports wagering. So the growth must be huge. Uh, what goes into that strategically uh, with, with what, you, what you do with your job at Fox, but with OutKick and everywhere else in terms of the possible growth of sports wagering in this country? Yeah, listen, it's a, it's a space that Fox is incredibly um, uh, bullish about. And I think um, unbiasedly, uh, Fox 
was clearly the, the most aggressive US media company to get into wagering when Passport was repealed um, a few years ago. Um, you know, I think that we really think about the market um, as a national market and, and the place that Fox plays is playing on a national scale, given we're a national brand with national reach. And so, you know, the best barometer we have, we think, for Fox's, you know, right to play in the space and residences in the space is the success of Fox Bet Super 6, our free-to-play game, which um, has been running for a few years now. And as you would have seen as well, we market heavily across our NFL broadcasts and other sporting broadcasts. And there's over 6 million users of, the, of that game now. And um, as I said, we think that is the best pointer towards how dominant Fox will ultimately be in, in sports wagering. Um, obviously, we have Fox Bet as well, which has been a, um, a nice success in the markets that it's, that it's live. And, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're investing heavily in, in the content side as well. Um, we're, we're promoting our free-to-play game um, aggressively and, and, you know, we're very, very bullish about Fox's right to play um, uh, in, in wagering as, as it reaches the national scale. Ed Hartman, our guest with Fox. Um, so like, when we think TV networks, you think of the big four. Do you think we're headed there in sports wagering as things expand? There, there are a lot of smaller wagering sites, but you still have Fox Bets and FanDuel and DraftKings and Penn and BetMGM. Are we headed to an era where there will be the big four or big five and that's it? Listen, scale clearly matters, and that's been proven to be the case in other markets. We look at, you know, the UK and Australia as example as great analogues for how this market might end up. Um, having said that, I think it's far too early to declare the winners. You know, we're, we're barely, in my opinion, midway through the first innings of what is a long, long, long nine-inning game uh, at least, and um, and so I think declaring the winners now is um, is probably uh, folly. Um, you know. Uh, there are a number of operators out there in my mind who have pros and cons and who have, um, you know, um, reasons why they, they might succeed or otherwise. But look, as I said, it's a long-winded answer, but ultimately, um, you know, what other markets have shown you is that there um, typically is a, a decent handful, say half a dozen of, of winners and then a longer tail of, of contenders. But I, I do certainly believe that whilst we may ultimately mirror those, that, that type of market structure, that it's far too early to be declaring the winners at this point in time. We talked about the simulcast nature uh, of the USFL, and, and you think of networks oftentimes as competitors, which they are. Uh, I'm curious about how difficult it was to come to an agreement with NBC on this because this is historic, Ed. It's not something that we see all the time, two networks working together, simulcasting, and partnering up in, in, in showing off the league. So how difficult was that? Look, NBC are a wonderful partner and um, and they've been really bullish about the USFL since we started speaking to them. Um, it's very, very rare for a startup league to have two broadcast networks supporting it to the extent that Fox and NBC is. It's very, very rare for any startup league to have two broadcast networks like um, Fox and NBC pay a rights fee. Um, and so I think that's a pretty clear indication of how bullish both Fox and NBC is about the product and about what we're doing with the USFL. Um, and listen, I think when Eric Shanks came up with the idea, people grabbed it with both hands from both Fox and NBC. So I'm not going to say it was easy, but I think the level of excitement around the league and around the concept was such that when this idea was thrown out there, it was grabbed with both hands. You're, you're into more football now, and you obviously are, are big in the NFL and college football space. Um, it seems more and more like football is distancing itself from, from everything else. How, how conscious is Fox of that constantly while you might have other entities? America's appetite for football seems to be overtaking other, other sports uh, at an alarming rate. Yeah, without question. You know, we often say that Fox is football and, you know, Fox really, the Fox, you know, business was built on the, the NFL um, and football and, and, and now uh, college football as well. So, again, it's no fluke that, that if we we're going to start a sport league, it would be football. Um, you know, to your point, Paul, the demand for football in this country is insatiable. And so um, it made total sense that when we thought about starting a league ourselves, that football would be the product that was, uh, was on the field. 66 days from kickoff, Ed. When do you uh, – well, maybe this is one of the big announcements, but when do you hope to have the draft? When will fans be able to see these teams? 
Yeah, so there's going to be a draft um, later on this month, twenty uh, second of of, um, of of February. That's been uh, announced, um, and so we'll start to see some more, you know, shape around um, the, the players and the teams themselves. Um, you know, it's clear to us there's a lot of demand from um, spring foot football officiandos for us to make announcements, and and I can you know um, assure you there are many many exciting announcements coming in the. In the um, in the weeks ahead, um, we're just trying to be measured and, and thought out about how we make those announcements. But as I said, towards the end of this month, you'll start to see some more shape and around you know who's going to be playing and, and who's going to be on the teams. And from there, we'll you know we'll start uh, running into training camp um, in in mid to late March, and then the season in April. You're certainly uh, open invite to make one of those announcements with us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anytime ah. you like. Come on, whenever you want, and make those announcements. So we- we we have a pretty good line of you guys, so uh, it would be a natural choice, I'm sure. I hope, hope you guys can make it over to Birmingham. It's not a very far, far drive from Nashville. We're, we're two and a half hours away from Absolutely. Birmingham and Nashville, so we'll definitely make it down. Excellent, excellent. Ed, Ed Hartman has been our guest, uh, VP with Fox, and a, a big hand in everything going on with the USFL. Ed, thank you so much. And uh, this will not be the the final visit for sure, as we near the the season kickoff this spring of the USFL. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Thank Ed. You. Ed Hartman has been our guest. Yes, 66 days away. Jeff Fisher will be on with us tomorrow uh, live on Radio Row. He's coming back to his home state, or one of them. <laughs> so, uh, he, is, gets, he comes to L.A., and he's going to hit Radio Row tomorrow to promote the league. This is the home state for him, an L.A. guy, uh, and went to USC. So looking forward to talking with him. Looking forward to our guest coming up next, too. Yeah. Clay Travis joins us next as we broadcast on Radio Row at Super Bowl 56 for OutKick 360.
are live from the L.A. Convention Center. Downtown Los Angeles is where Radio Row is taking place. Alongside Chad Withrow and Paul Koharski, I'm Jonathan Hutton. Pleased to be joined by our fearless leader, Clay Travis of OutKick, who is uh, joining us from Century City, probably uh, from a palace or a mansion. We'll see when we'll find out later tonight. Clay, hope you're doing well, man. Yeah, I'm on the uh, Fox lot right now. I've got my uh, TV show here in about an hour, uh, Fox Bet Live, you know, the uh, college, uh, college and NFL and every sport gambling show we do. Uh, and then uh, I've got Sean Hannity tonight. I already did my radio show. So a lot of different moving parts. Uh, it's always a busy week for Super Bowl week. Uh, and I guess it's a good sign that every year feels like I get a little bit busier. Clay, California Governor Gavin Newsom decided to lift the mask mandate the day after the Super Bowl, also, I believe, the day after you <laughs> leave. Do you think this was done just to piss you off? Uh, look, uh, I would love to debate Gavin Newsom. I think I would wipe the floor with him over the stupidity of mask mandates. I mean, I'll give you an example right now. I'm unvaccinated, right? So I get tested uh, pretty regularly. I've already had Omicron. I've already had the alpha version. But in my hotel... I am allowed to go to the bar. I am allowed to stay in the hotel to walk through the lobby, but I'm not allowed to go to the restaurant um, for, uh, to eat in the restaurant. So, I mean, what logical sense does that make? I can be in a crowded bar. I can be in a crowded hotel. I can sleep and stay in the hotel. I can ride the elevators, all of those things, but I'm not allowed to go to the restaurant. I mean, Anybody with a functional brain that's defending COVID uh, regulations in the state of California right now, well, frankly, they don't have a functional brain, and that would include California Governor Gavin Newsom. Clay, with the Auburn situation, uh, one I wanted to ask you about, I can't think of a time where a university has put out multiple statements <laughs> saying that they're just debating on whether or not the coach is going to stay. Makes me think that he's going to be gone, but I don't know that there's a precedent for what Auburn is doing right now with Brian Harson. Well, it ha not one that has dragged on this long. And it seems quite clear that what they're looking for is cause to allow them to fire him. Uh, and so far, either they don't have it or it's not substantial enough for their legal team to sign off on it. And people out there who are wondering what that might look like, it's the difference between having to pay $18.3 million to him in order to leave, which would be an amazing payout. I mean, he'd get over $20 million for coaching in Auburn for one year. And I'm sure he doesn't want to get fired, but there's a lot of people out there who would say, hey, I'd work anywhere for one year if it got me $20 million, even if I got fired at the end of it. Uh, and what's wild about this with Roe is I was down at the Iron Bowl and Auburn was in great shape to beat Alabama and they would have knocked Alabama out of being able to be in the college football playoff, presumably. Although who knows, maybe they still would have gotten in with two losses if they had whipped Georgia like they did. Instead, Right? Instead, you end up in this wild scenario where in the space of a few months, everybody is ready for Brian Harson to be gone. And even a guy like Derek Mason, former Vanderbilt head football coach who was the defensive coordinator down on the Plains at Auburn last year, has decided to take several hundred thousand dollars less to go be the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma State among many other coordinators. I think he's been through five, lots of players transferring. All is not well down in Auburn. The question is, can they find a reason to fire Harson or not? Uh, and the longer this drags on, the worse it looks for him and, frankly, for Auburn University as well. Oh, it's going to pay off uh, big for other coaches that can use Auburn for a February-slash-March pay increase, the same way Bruce Pearl used yeah, Louisville. Yeah, that's crazy, too. Yeah, and, and I don't know who Auburn turns to, Clay. Do you have anyone in mind other than just elevating someone on staff at this point? Well, I haven't read the, the, the new contracts that Lane Kiffin and Hugh Free signed, so I don't know <laughs> what buyout they would be owed. But, uh, but obviously, I think you would have to put them on the list. Kevin Steele, who now he was the defensive coordinator of Maryland for like 12 hours, and now he's defensive coordinator at Miami. Theoretically, Kevin Steele could be in the mix because, remember, there was a contingent of Auburn alums that wanted to make Kevin Steele their head coach when they ended up deciding to go uh, with Brian Harson and moved on from Gene Chizik. And then I think you have to start to look around at really successful coordinators in conference. To me, a guy that comes to mind, Kendall Bryles, uh, has been really successful with what he has done at Arkansas as the offensive coordinator under Sam Pittman. Uh, I think Barry Odom, who was previously the coach at Missouri, uh, could also get a look. 
Um, it's going to be a tough spot for Auburn to be making a move. I don't think, depending on how much they have to spend Harson and what kind of uh, buyout dollars might be on the horizon there, I just don't know how much Auburn's going to spend to have a brand new coach. It's a wild story. Understand it's early, but if you got out your stacks of money right now and made a couple plays pertaining to the Super Bowl, what might they be? I like uh, the Rams uh, to win. Uh, I think they're going to win by double digits. I got the Rams 27-17. to 17. I like the under. To me, ultimately, this game comes down to Matthew Stafford. If you think that Matthew Stafford is going to play well, and I do, with Sean McVay having two weeks to prepare for him uh, and get ready for the Bengals, I think the Rams are the better team. I think they are more talented on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. Not taking anything away from Cincinnati, who has won twice as outright underdogs on the road against both the Titans and the Chiefs, and obviously won a game against the Raiders. The Bengals are rolling right now, uh, but ultimately I think this is Matthew Stafford and Sean McVay's Super Bowl to win. I like the idea of Jalen Ramsey matching up against Jamar Chase. He's begging for that matchup. I think he will do well. I'm still not sold on that Cincinnati Bengal defensive offensive line, which we saw get exploited to the tune of nine sacks. Two more sacks, by the way, to 11 that would have been counted if there hadn't been a timeout and a a delay of game penalty uh, when they were playing against the Titans. I think that if you were watching that film, Aaron Donald and uh, and Floyd and uh, and Von Miller and everybody else on that defense for uh, this, the, the, the Rams has to be giddy about the opportunity they've got. I like the Rams to win by double digits, give Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford the Super Bowl. Clay, need a really short answer here, but have you been cleared by the restaurant we're going to for dinner tonight? <laughs> Do you know that you're going to be able to join us? It's on the rooftop, it's outdoors, but no, I don't know 100% that I'm going to be able to get in. Now, I do have a negative test in my possession because I had to get a negative test this morning coming onto the Fox lot. So I've got it in my jacket pocket. I could grab it right now and hold it up for everybody. Uh, So I'm hoping that that will be sufficient uh, to allow me to get in, but who knows, I might get turned away. Well, uh, it's going to uh, crush my dreams of watching a sunset with you, Clay. So please, please get yeah. there on time. But we'll eat an extra I entree Mine for you too. if we have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clay, good to see you, man. No and, doubt. Uh, we'll see you tonight and catch up later this week on the show. Hopefully, you'll see me tonight. Who knows? I might not be allowed in. Well, we'll come over after. <laughs> see you guys. We'll, <laughs> see you, Clay Travis. Thanks. Join you at the mansion yeah, afterward. Either way, absolutely. We'll get the we'll get Clay's car and. Have the driver drop us off at Clay's place. Well, one time he was in L.A., he hung out with Mark Paul Gosseler. So I've been pushing for Zach Morris as a guest in the show for a while. Maybe we'll go to his house. Who knows? We, we push, we push, we push. We make no progress. Yeah, we, we're we're going we're gonna to make it happen one Tonight's way or the other. Tonight's the night. We're going to show up at his house. <laughs> I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that. Tonight's the night. Uh, wink, wink. We've got John McClain coming up uh, to begin hour number two. Andrew Perloff, uh, you may know him as McLovin from the Dan Patrick Show. He's now joined uh, a morning show with CBS Radio. He's going to stop by in hour number two as well uh, for a, always a fun chat. He's been a long time show yeah, for him. We, we made a professional transition, and he has as well, so we can have a conversation about that. And we'll preview uh, a bit of, of Super Bowl 56 and get back to some of the headlines that includes Brady and Kyler Murray. All of a sudden, Kyler Murray has removed any reference this to is the odd. Arizona Should Cardinals. we put him on the market? This is odd. Might as well. If you're looking for a trade partner and you want a contract that's affordable, and one that expires at the end of next season, Kyler Murray's your guy. What could the Cardinals get in, re- in exchange for, for Murray if, in fact, they want to part ways? Not saying they do, but it's a story to watch. John McClain hits all the NFL headlines with us next on OutKick 360.
Hour number two from Radio Row, Tuesday edition is here, live in Los Angeles with you across the OutKick Network. This is OutKick 360 with Chad Withrow and Paul Koharski. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Uh, shout out to everybody with OutKick and Fox making the show happen today. Uh, the best crew and staff we could ask for as we hit the road and we've been out west. We, of course, we're not on Radio Row at this time last year. Um, so we didn't see our next guest on Radio Row last year due to COVID restrictions. But, guys, doesn't it feel a bit odd that John McClain is about to join us virtually on Zoom and not on Radio Row? Because, as we well know, when the man is on Radio Row, he's in high demand. Well, if a Super Bowl happens without John McClain's presence, is it actually a Super Bowl? I had to ask myself this question as I prepared to head to Los Angeles because the man has been to virtually every Super Bowl. Yeah. And I've never not seen John McClain on Radio Row at any Super Bowl I've attended. So this is new territory for us. John McClain joins us, and he's covered the league for nearly five decades. John, hope you're doing well. I am, and you never know. Maybe I'll be back there with you guys next year in Arizona uh, on Radio Row. I would love that. Would love that. Um, let, let's start with, uh, speaking of love, Lovey Smith. Uh, Houston ends up with Lovey Smith as the next Texans head coach. Will you take us through the last week or so of how they ended up just getting Lovey Smith elevated to become the next head coach and not one of the three that we were discussing last week, which of course included Josh McCown? They were prepared to hire Josh McCown despite local and national ridicule because he's never been a coach at any level other than high school. But they were determined to do it. And then Brian Flores, one of their finalists, filed his lawsuit against the NFL. That includes the Texans. And I think every team that was in the process of hiring a new coach backed up and reevaluated. And the Texans did. And they're looking around, okay. And of course, Brian Flores is never going to get hired once he filed a lawsuit. He's trying to go work for an owner and he's trying to get him to open his books and expose himself financially and everything else. That ain't happening. So they look around, and they and Lovey Smith is an associate head coach, so he'd been in on the process. And I kind of wondered why they never interviewed him to begin with. Well, all of a sudden they interviewed him on Monday morning, and then he got the job late Monday at his first news conference today. He's the first African-American to get a third chance to be a head coach in the NFL. And for what this team needs, they don't need a guy that's never coached. They need an experienced guy with a steady hand because they are still undergoing a rebuilding process and will be undergoing a rebuilding process next season as well. So, John, let me clarify here. Do you think that this was Brian Flores' job had he not filed the lawsuit? No, it was Josh McCown's job. No, McCown, Flores, and Jonathan Gannon, the Eagles defense coordinator with the finalists, each of them interviewed twice. McCown had three interviews. They interviewed him in January. Then he went and coached high school to see his sons play uh, this past season. So, no, they were going to hire Josh McCown. They won't admit any of this, of course, but that's a fact. Now they're considering having him on the staff, which would be ridiculous because he needs to get seasoning somewhere else. He doesn't need every day fans and media talking about the head coach in waiting, Josh McCown. Well, and, John, you've got you know Brian Flores' legal team now issuing a statement saying that they're happy for Lovey Smith, but Brian Flores is more qualified, and he would have gotten the job had he not filed a, a lawsuit. What's your reaction to that statement? Give me a break. Lovey Smith's been in a Super Bowl. You take away his first year in Chicago. His, his record in Chicago was 24 games over 500. Coach of the year. I don't see Flores coach of the year. I don't see Flores taking Miami to a Super Bowl. And then Lovey Smith went to Miami. 2-14. and 14. Then he played Jameis Winston as a rookie. They improved by four games and he got fired. And his career record is 18 games over 500, including 3-3 in the playoffs. His credentials are so much more impressive than Brian Flores. But that's Flores' attorney, so what else is he going to say? You mentioned Gannon as well, right? Uh, so, so the impression here, McC- McCown, and, McCown and Gannon uh, McCown certainly a lot more not experienced. Gannon also not particularly experienced. They can't hire either of those guys for appearances' sake. 
based on the accusation by, by Flores, not, not against them, but against the league? No, first of all, uh, Gannon was very impressive in his interview. He's been a coordinator one year. And Kevin O'Connell, one of the uh, coaches they interviewed, a coordinator one year. And, of course, Mil- I mean, uh, uh, Brian Flores was never a coordinator when the Dolphins hired him. He coached linebackers and called plays for the Patriots. So they couldn't have got anybody more experienced. The weird thing is they didn't interview him till Monday, even though he was part of the process giving his opinion in the interviews about these other coaches. And then all of a sudden, hmm, well, let's see, let's shift here. Let's pivot from McCown to no experience to Lovey Smith, who's 63, has 38 years of coaching experience, including 20 in the NFL. And one thing they can never be accused of is age discrimination. They've gone from 72-year-old Romeo Cornell to 65-year-old David Culley to 63-year-old Lovey Smith, but it shows they're getting younger every time they change coaches. John McClain with us uh, with the Houston Chronicle, TexasSportsNation.com, and more. Uh, we're going to get to some new head coaches in just a moment. Uh, I know the Titans have just extended the contracts of Mike Vrabel and John Robinson. Um, and, John, they've also confirmed that Tim Kelly is the passing game coordinator for uh, the foreseeable future. He's, he's joining uh, this offensive staff. What can you tell us about the former Texans offensive coordinator? And they hire another former Texans coach. Rabel's got so many, I can't keep up with them. Tim Kelly, two years ago, everybody talked about, man, what a great job Tim Kelly's doing. Man, he's doing a great job on play calling. This offense is tremendous. The passing game is one of the three best in the NFL. Well, he had Deshaun Watson playing great. And it wasn't his fault that Deshaun Watson wanted to be traded. Watson said in his last news conference after that season, he wanted Tim Kelly back as the coordinator. They kept him. All of a sudden, he's coaching a rookie, Davis Mills, and having to play way before they wanted him to play because of the injury of Tyrod Taylor. So playing a rookie, Davis Mills, who made a lot of progress over the last five games, everybody says, Tim Kelly can't coach. He's terrible. Fire him. So they did. I thought it was a tremendous move by Mike Vrabel to get Tim Kelly up there. He'd been here eight years, worked his way up the hard way. Very smart guy, very shrewd, and hopefully he can help Ryan Tannehill not throw so many interceptions. Well, John, I thought that Tom Brady was definitely retired. And then he spoke last night, and he gave the line, never say never, which people say that. I understand that one. But he took it a step further and went on to say, I don't know how I'm going to be feeling six months from now. Who knows what's going to happen? I'm taking it day by day, which leads me to believe maybe we haven't seen the last of Tom Brady. What do you think? Chad, like that reminds me of Brett Favre. Every year he was ready to retire. Then he spent about three months rehabbing, being with his family. Then he got the itch to play, and he kept playing. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Brady talked about his family. You know, his wife, Giselle, she knows how much he loves it. I don't know if they want him moping around the house all the time. Problem is, he's got to make up his mind because if he's not coming back, they got to get another quarterback. It'd be grossly unfair if he has not made up his mind by March 16th when the new league year begins. If not then, for free agency, certainly when the draft begins on April 28th. He can't drag this out and then them go look for another veteran quarterback. John, the Shanahan and McVay tree continues uh, in these hiring practices across the league. Kevin O'Connell, the new head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, uh, he'll be calling plays or be a part of the coaching staff, excuse me, this this Sunday for the Rams. Uh, And meanwhile, Mike McDaniel, who heads up the, the run game in San Francisco for Kyle Shanahan, he's now in Miami and McDaniel has followed Shanahan everywhere he's been throughout his his coaching history. Your thoughts on Miami's decision to go with Mike McDaniel as the new head coach of the Dolphins? Well, I call it the Gary Kubiak coaching tree because Kyle Shanahan and Mike McDaniel, Robert Sala, they were all on Kubiak's staff here in Houston. And, And McDaniel is really good friends with Shanahan. They go way back. You know, he's minority. So that counts for the Dolphins. Dolphins and Texans, only two of the nine teams to hire minorities as head coach. McDaniel's very studious. He kind of looks like a professor, but he's learned a lot from Kyle. 
Kyle's much more emotional than he is. And so if you're going to hire somebody, if you get them from the Shanahan or the McVay coaching tree, they seem to work out. Now, both those guys are hotter than ever. A year ago, Kyle Shanahan, they're starting to point out, well, he's only had one winning season. Now he's so hot he can't sit down. And then Sean McVay, of course, at one point when he went to Super Bowl two years ago, people are saying, well, if you shook hands with Sean McVay or you waved at him at an airport, that's good enough for you to be head coach in the NFL. Everybody made fun of Zach Taylor. He was on that staff for the first two years McVay was there. Now he's in the Super Bowl trying to beat his mentor. What ended things for, for Doug Peterson in Philadelphia seemed to be the micromanagement of Howie Roseman and, and Jeffrey Lurie. Uh, if I remember correctly, they had Tuesday meetings where they analyzed his every move and uh, second-guessed him to death. I don't know that that's Trent Baalke's operation, but certainly uh, he's a difficult guy to deal with. How much of an obstacle to success do you think he'll be for Super Bowl-winning Peterson as he tries to be the next guy to get the Jaguars on track? Paul, as you know, when a guy wants to be a head coach, especially when he's out of football, especially when he was fired, he'll say anything. Sure, Trent Baalke, I'd love to work with Trent. And maybe he does. Maybe he knows him. You know, most coaches seem to have an aversion to working with Baalke. I don't know why. He was with with, uh, Jim Harbaugh in San Francisco, and at the end, everybody had to walk on eggshells around him because Harbaugh was always in such a bad mood. So I don't know. He sold himself to Shad Khan. Now Doug Peterson's got that job having Trevor Lawrence. Very attractive for a new coach. So hopefully he won't have that kind of micromanagement. I don't think Shad Khan does that. But I've never heard of, of, of an owner and a general manager going over at coaching decisions with a coach on Tuesday when he's supposed to be working on the next game plan. John, who are you picking to win Super Bowl 56 this Sunday? Guys, I'm picking the Rams. They're playing at home. They're very hot. You know, they've got a great pass rush. We saw what happened last year when the Chiefs could not protect Patrick Mahomes from the Buccaneers' pass rush, and the Rams' pass rush is even better. I look for Matthew Stafford to be the MVP, him or Aaron Donald. Can't wait to see the game. Bengals are young. They'll have a chance to come back as long as Joe Burrow is healthy. Everyone counting the Bengals out. I, I, this is pro- forcing me the other way. It's, 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 it's exactly <laughs> what they want. Yep. That's exactly what it's just what you heard wants. before Kansas yeah. City. So far, and John, it is 100% picks for the Rams with every analyst that we've asked here in town. It wouldn't bother me at all if the Bengals win for Zach Taylor. I met him when his future father-in-law, Mike Sherman, was offensive line coach, assistant uh, head coach here under Gary Kubiak. And uh, I used to know his wife, Sarah. They're a great family. And uh, I wouldn't mind seeing the Bengals win their first Super Bowl. I covered the two losses with a heartbreaker after the 88 season. Joe Montana and John Taylor. So if they pull it out, think about this. Joe Burrow won a state championship in Ohio. He won a national championship at LSU. And in his second season, he could win a Super Bowl. What a winner. All in the span of, what, seven or eight years he would win those titles. It's pretty impressive. Which is just crazy to think about. John, always appreciate you. Thank you for the insight and the perspective today. And uh, we'll check in with you. We'll be recapping this game with you next week. Miss you. Wish you were here. Guys, guys, thank you very much. I wish I were there, too, and maybe next year. Absolutely. Follow him on Twitter, at McLean underscore on underscore NFL. John McLean has been our guest. Coming up, Andrew Perloff. Now with CBS Sports Radio and doing some some things with Odyssey, with a new show, formerly of the Dan Patrick Show. Our friend of this show, He's Andrew a buddy. Perloff, He's McLovin. A buddy. He joins us next on Outkick 360.
Paul Koharski. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Pleased to be joined by Andrew Perloff. Out kick 360 from Super Bowl 56 Radio Row and with Chad Ruth Road, Paul Koharski. I, I, I saw him pleased to be joined by Andrew Radio Perloff. Row a couple of days ago. You and then may I realized him as no, McLovin to the Dan Patrick Show. Maggie and Perloff. That's yep, what I said whenever I saw him walking name, Radio Andrew Row Perloff. a couple of days ago. And then I realized. Uh, yeah, so you feel no, out McLovin, I'm just going to keep on walking. Maggie and Perloff. Well, I wanted to roll this back and offer my condolences for the big fight you had with Dan and the Danettes and the falling out. and. I'll tell you how happy I was that Maggie t- took you in after after things fell apart for yeah. you. How are you holding up? Well, it was good. I mean, like, the Dan Patrick show, you know, there's only, like, you know, there's one superstar. There's two egos in that room, and me and Dan. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, Dan. room wasn't big enough for both of you, you're yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, I mean, After you know, 20 years. I'm like, Dan, what have you ever done in this business? You know, <laughs> like, I'm Andrew Perloff. I'm McLovin, you know. And it, no, Dan and I had an amazing, like, transition. Like, he was so happy for me, which I was actually... I told this story on the show. I was so scared to go in there because I'd been there 12 years. And I was like, Dan, I'm leaving. And I was on the brink of tears. And uh, he was so nice about it. <laughs> I was really relieved because I thought he, I don't know what I thought, but I thought, you know, he might say, uh, oh, I'm going to, I have no idea. I thought it might be like the You're dolphins. dead in this business. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, thought might, I thought it might be like the Dolphins of Brian Flores where they're going to, he could have trashed me on the way out or something. I have no idea. Are the other Danettes now lining up to try to get the hell out? No, no, no. <laughs> you know what? One of the big issues was I live very far away. Paul, you know, I'm in Brooklyn and Dan's in Milford, Connecticut. So that was that was part of it. Uh, it was it was a lot of things. You know, it wasn't just that. Also, too, I wanted a new opportunity. Been there 12 years. But Dan was awesome about it. It's been very helpful. So uh, it, it's it's we're parallel a bit here because we left after the three of us left uh, after a decade doing the same show. Yeah. And that was the appeal for what you and the Danettes and, and DP, what, what you guys did was you were together from the start to whenever we left mm-hmm. because you were also on the zone in Nashville at the time. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I wonder the, the emotions, the feelings that you felt whenever you left and you made the decision, you know, now's the time because we did that a year ago. Yeah, no, it, it was hard uh, because you get comfortable with where you are. You know, and I'll, I'll be totally honest, like sometimes I miss – aspects of the Dan Patrick show too because those are my good friends like and yesterday they had Will Farrell on and he painted his face like a bangle I'm like oh my god like I love that because Dan to one credit like he can get certain he has certain relationships that other people don't have for example he got me in an Adam Sandler movie that's coming out in May uh, called Hustle and like Dan got me a speaking role this time Whoa. so like um, you know the Maggie and Perloff show is going to be awesome we're having a blast But I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to be Adam Sandler's best friend. Not that I was. So there are certain things that I miss. And also the guys. Like, those are, you guys know those guys. I mean, Paul and Seton and Todd and Dan are all awesome dudes. So it's a little weird, like, not to be able to, like, chat with them every morning. We would do an hour show. I don't know if you guys do this still, but we would do an hour show before the three hour show where we would just sit on the couch and argue about everything. And then uh, we use all our good material. And Dan, <laughs> Dan would always yell, Just "Stop! Stop doing the debate right now! Let's do it on the radio!" But we couldn't help it. So I miss the guys is the most thing. But I love the new uh, people at CBS Sports are amazing. Maggie's awesome. I've known her forever. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Maggie Gray. She was at Sports Illustrated with me for a long time. Then she was at WFAN, and she's super cool. So that's been a lot of fun. Not that you were tanking yeah. it on the Dan Patrick show, <laughs> but is there a renewed energy? You know, we went and did a new thing, and there was a, a little burst of energy when you yeah. start something new. Are you feeling that now with the new show? Yeah. You know, it's funny, too. It's also, like, a lot harder to transit. Well, I don't know, but you, you guys still kind of have the same format, though. Which for me, it's Largely. a lot different. Because you know, I went the, from, the hardest part is telling yeah. people, you know, where we are now. Yeah. Where people are like, hey, where'd you go? What, yeah. you know, what happened? Mm-hmm. It's the transition of everyone knowing, okay, this is what I'm doing now. That's been the most difficult part. Everybody knew where you guys were going, though. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, because it, the world is driven by social media. So yeah. it's like you find people that way. I honestly, I don't know if you thought you had a problem with that, but everybody talked about oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know. Well, but, you know, I, I was reading Barrett Sports Media's rankings today, and the first thing they said was, your show wasn't eligible because I it know. hasn't been on long enough. And I'm thinking, oh, there's a nice plug, though, for your new show. That's great. Yeah. I know, I know. But it goes it. to your point about social media. You see something, a story, and boom, you know well, about it. You know, it's interesting. You think about Fallon and uh, Stephen Colbert and those shows. Like, nobody stays up. Nobody my age stays up till 11.30 to watch them, but they live the next day socially. Like, uh, so we know those shows are relevant because we see the clips. So it's almost like a social world. You know, uh, like, you look around Ma- Radio Row, like, if you don't adapt to that, like, you're not going to really be as successful. You know, I know I live in, around the corner from a guy 
uh, Big Cat on part of my take. Yeah, yeah. And like, I think they had an incredible Fancy model. neighborhood. Yeah, where they, I know. <laughs> well, I'm surprised he hasn't moved up in class, but <laughs> they really like, they were one of the first ones who just really, a new media star in, in a way. You know, so I think we've all been trying to catch up to that. And like when you guys went to Outkick, like everybody knew, just so you know, like there was, it was not hard to find you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. What do you think about the proposal to replace Dartmouth in the Ivy League with SUNY Binghamton? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Your thoughts? I don't even know. Is, is Columbia still in the I, Ivy I love League? that you pretend this where Columbia yeah. is like, uh, if not number one, number two, like not, not in the number, Ivies, in the, in the world. At what? At, at being at losing, a university. At losing football uh, games? This yeah, is we're a, not a sport. This sport. is a sports show, though, so who has the better athletic department? Oh, well, that you have. Well, they do. Hard. There's no reason to go to Dartmouth except to play ball. There's nothing there. It's in the middle of a forest. So <laughs> I I, am I like the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I'm friends. You like the city, too. I've seen yeah. you loose in New York. Yeah, that's true. I had a Columbia football experience that blew me away. I went to the Dartmouth game a couple of years ago, and I know the AD at Columbia, who doesn't like you very much, by the way. It's a long story. I won't get into that. <laughs> yeah. It's a long list, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, and I sat there with Marcellus Wiley and Robert Kraft in a box nice. watching a Columbia Why game. Why did they let you in? And like, I'm like, I didn't know that there were celebrity uh, Columbia Yeah, go ahead. Fans. Name the Dartmouth guys that are comparable to Marcellus uh, Wiley and Robert Kraft. I don't know. You Dr. Heard, Seuss? You ever heard of Jay Fiedler? You ever heard of Robert <laughs> Frost? Dr. Robert Frost? You know, a fork in the road and one well, way. Let's go a little Andrew, more modern. Andrew let's Perlow. go a little more modern. Andrew Perlow. Uh Let's see. Dartmouth. Uh, most of, you know, the, remember that uh, financial collapse in 2007? That was all Dartmouth men. <laughs> <laughs> that was us. What a great ad for your university. Yeah, Remember yeah. that financial collapse of 07? That was us. Come here, learn, us. Uh, come here, learn how to build something and take people down. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, let's talk some football. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Rodgers and real estate. Aaron Rodgers is uh, building a house in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, and so, so it's a done deal, of course. The, the rumors start speculating. No one thinks it's a done deal. Uh, but he clearly was not happy in Green Bay going into last year. If you're John Robinson, the Titans, are you exploring this option? For a trade for Aaron Rodgers? Look, do you guys mind if I give you the national perspective? Yes. Yeah, please do. Anything to talk about Aaron Rodgers, don't, and I don't want to hear a salary cap. I don't even want to hear about it. I understand this is an issue. We spent three straight days talking about how Franklin sounds like a beautiful place to live. I'm sure it is. And Aaron Rodgers got to go to the Titans. Franklin makes, isn't even the right city. It's, oh, is it? It's Brentwood. It's actually Brentwood, oh, which, is, which is where just I live. Just north of Franklin. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. another fancy neighborhood. We'll be neighbors like you and Big Cat. <laughs> the perspective is, yeah. <laughs> what a weird uh, drop that was. I hope he doesn't hear that. So <laughs> the, uh, the this national perspective is, oh, my God, this has got to happen because I don't think anyone really wants to put the energy into looking at all the salary cap numbers. It's like, it's a great team. All they need is a quarterback. That is a perception. Like, oh, right, that's Daniel. accurate. Yeah, I mean, and if the you know if they can do something to get Aaron Rodgers, what is the stop? Like, I don't understand like why they're supporting Ryan Tannehill publicly. Like, when the Rams moved on from Goff to Stafford, they totally they were pretty mean about it. You know, <laughs> why is why are the Titans? Do you guys tell me why are they supporting him publicly? At least leave well, the door open. Because they to got Aaron so much money it's sunk money. into them, they're not going to be able to get out unless yeah. somebody does them a monstrous favor. Uh, in a deal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, three years ago, he did look like it, it was entirely reasonable after his 2019 mm. season to yeah. think this is the guy. What he's done since then, particularly in the playoffs, yeah. uh, you know, Nashville is universally, we've talked about this a lot on, on this show, Nashville now is universally from the most crazy fan to the to the harshest media critic, United, in that Ryan Tannehill can't take this team on a Super right. Bowl run. Right. He could get them to great position in the playoffs, but uh, partially because of the division. But come the playoffs in a tight fourth quarter game, he's not going to make the throws uh, they need to I win. I feel like Titans Multiple fans games. for so long just they, they, they bowed up and got defensive of Tannehill because the national perspective yeah. was not it's Miami enough. Tannehill. Yeah, he's yeah. going to revert to that at right. some point. And then back to back playoff performances where he sunk the Titans. They just threw their hands up and said, hey, national media was right. Yeah. This guy can't win it all. He's never going to win big. Go explore your options. He might right. win you one or two. He's not going to take you on a streak of four to, to a Super Bowl championship. But is it an insult to be moved aside for Aaron Rodgers? It's Aaron Rodgers. No. He's like the third, like second most talented or first most talented quarterback yep. of all time. So I don't even feel like you have to rip Ryan Tannehill. If you can get Aaron Rodgers in the building, you know, who's still at the top of his game, I, I see I would move heaven and earth. I mean – I don't know. Do you guys know? Is there any way they can get around well, this? I mean, cap issue? so the, to me, the yeah, the, I don't the hope is. of yeah. it is, if the Rams pulled off what they did mm -hmm. for Stafford and Goff, clearly a lesser quarterback, it can happen. It's not likely, and I don't know if the Packers would do it, but it's been done. 
it yes. can be done again if someone's willing to – well, someone being the Packers yep. to make that move. I don't think the Packers – if they make a move – Rodgers, I don't think they're going to want Tannehill. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they do they have to they have to give, give Jordan Love a shot at least, right? Yeah, or get something better to, yeah. in, I mean, in, in return. That's yeah. why you drafted him, right? I think they were planning for this, just not the way it's all turned out. I don't, I don't think they thought they, they were going to have back-to-back MVP seasons no. for the guy. And their glimpses of Love, unfortunately for them, haven't been very good. Right. There's a, we've had a few – uh, NFL guests on, and everyone's predicting Denver. They like we're making every we're actually doing a thing where everyone has to make a prediction that comes on where Aaron Rodgers is going to go, and it's either Packers or Denver. No one is uh, because of the money. I think no one's picking the Titans. Well, and there's there's talk that that Rodgers and Devontae Adams are yeah. going to be a pair right. wherever they end up. Which yeah. I mean, consider that for some of the teams that'll be in that market. I don't think Carolina is well suited to to win right away, yeah. but I think nobody will want him more than David Tepper. Absolutely, but I think don't you think Jimmy G would make sense there? I think they would give a sec- high second round pick for Jimmy G. I think that. I mean, if you round. could if you could guarantee some sort of health yeah. with with him, I think it'd be a great option for a lot of teams. I think it'd probably be a good option in, in Pittsburgh, which wouldn't have to give up that much. Right. Well, but, I, I but, mean, Carolina will go after Rodgers, but I assume yeah. Rodgers is not going to want to go there because there's too much of a rebuild. So I'm saying, like, well, we're not getting Rodgers, so that's the next step down. Yeah, but I think Tepper uh, yeah. is going to get sick of getting. You know, he, working the middling quarterbacks yeah. and climbing that ladder of middling guys. At some point, he's going to do something huge. Maybe it'll be Deshaun Watson if that gets cleared up. And uh, yeah, I, I, but the Watson's got too much control. All these guys have a lot of control over where they go. Yeah, I don't see Watson getting cleared uh, unless you guys. I mean, I don't know anything specific about it, but it feels like criminal stuff's coming down. Yeah, no, it sounded like timing. it was two or three settlements yeah. away from going to Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. Is there some NFL envy in New York, being a New Yorker right now for Los Angeles, when you see their two teams versus what's going on well, with I, the Giants and the Jets? I'm a Philadelphia Eagle. I'm from yeah. Philly. So give us the. I, we're asking for the New York yeah, yeah, perspective. Yeah. You love, were so kind to give us the national perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Now please give us the New York perspective. The New yeah, York, screw we'll ask for the Philly perspective. I'll, t- I'll be honest. Like New York, they talk about the Yankees and Mets offseason on the radio. They talk about the Knicks. They just don't focus on the pro teams. You know, there are a lot of the Big Giants, college time. They, they've, they've given up. I mean, in a way. <laughs> they've given up on being great. Look at And for good reason, the Jets and the Giants have been terrible lately. No, there's not a lot of... There are a lot of local calls about what the Giants and Jets need to do. They needed to fire Joe Judge. And the Jets, like, they love – they like Robert Sala and they like Joe Douglas, but I don't think they have any hope. So I don't think there's jealousy. It's almost like they've moved on to their other sports. Is there any hope in Houston right now with the Texans oh, and what's going on? I was shocked about what It's weird spent. when you can't even figure Smith out what they're trying to do, right? <laughs> Usually he, you may disagree with something, but yeah. you can look at a situation and say, I get what the attempt is here. Yeah. I don't know what they're trying to do in Houston. Does he right keep now. the beard as a head coach? Oh, do you have to him. change it? Must. Well, you know, I'm like the world's father wisdom. The world's biggest Illinois football fan. Always have How'd been. That come? Going back to Jeff George and uh, I can't really name another player <laughs> from there. But I do not understand this hire because if you watch Lovey Smith's Illinois, it was like that was coaching like he was Her- off on an island horrific. in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this is very surprising. You know, I did see Brian Flores' comments that he thought he had the job, then the lawsuit came out. That kind of makes sense. You know, they hired, the funny thing, too, they fired Cully a couple days after everybody else did. I think they, it's speculative, but maybe they were going to hire Brian Flores, and then they got word from the Dolphins that something was coming. Or I have no idea. But it doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem like they knew what they were doing at the last day of the season to now. So I thought that they were automatically firing Cully to hire one of Casario's New England buddies, and mm. it was either going to be... Uh, well, it, yeah. Flores came into it a, a touch late. I thought it was going to be McDaniel's or um, Mayo. Oh yeah, uh, Mayo would have been that would have been fun. Somebody young and somebody with a little life. But now yeah. you know nothing gets Lovey Smith. But he doesn't exactly scream like uh, he's you know scream. Oh, I'm excited to watch this guy coach. So I, I mean, no, they, they yeah. wanted McCown. Yeah, and then yeah. no one else, no one else would jump on board with it uh, and, and interview him as a head coaching candidate. But I think that what would have worked is because Flores, to me, was the best option of who they were interviewing. Just, you know, the 30,000-foot view of it. Um, I would try to <clears throat> get Flores to be your head coach and run the defense and then hire McCown to run your offense because that's what they're mm-hmm. – they love that guy. I just don't think he's head coach. And he may like, still be the offensive coordinator. I've, I read something that, that he could be Lovey's 
offensive coordinator. I'm yeah. kind of a Josh McCown fan. I, I don't know. I know. I, I read you like his high school performances as no, coach? I just like, I like just watch him on the side. I'm a big backup quarterback fan. You know, like. Uh, you like guys that's who look like so Yvonne. so perfect Yvonne, for you. Yeah, yeah. You I like guys who look like Yvonne Drago? That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I think By about way, when he, I see McCown he's every sne- time. sneaky tall, right? He's oh, like yeah. a gigantic guy. I'm a big, like, you know, I'm very good friends with Case Keenan. We've talked about this. Uh, Andy Dalton, like, there's a certain level of Are you a Logan Woodside guy? You should write a book on backup I found quarterbacks. Bad. I really, I, yeah. I, I Get inside I, the mind of the backup quarterback. Yeah, the but bank they, account. they all become just <laughs> NFL head coaches. You know, like, strange. how many, but I actually went through. The, it's I, like catchers for baseball managers. I actually said the other day that all backup quarterbacks become coaches, but I think there are only eight or nine backup quarterbacks now who are coaches. It's less than I thought. Well, wow. you really ought to graph this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I'm not on social. Uh, I am, I'm really doing deep dives here. I'm doing the analytic work that you guys are just too lazy to do, by the way. <laughs> That's I'm sorry. True. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, we come from a market with Logan Woodside. So. I do like Logan Woodside. I, I, uh, <laughs> you're, the, you're the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, is he, but I always get him confused with that guy who's on Hard Knocks. Who is, uh, there's another backup quarterback who has a na- similar name. Was he on Hard Knocks? No. no. I'm going to forget this guy's name. <laughs> he was in Cleveland behind Johnny Manziel, and he became a star on Hard Docs. Can I, can I look it up on my phone right now? Was it? Well, is he talking about Tanny? No. Alex no. Tanny? Uh, I don't know who it would be. This, he was is, defi- this, is, this is the content we came for, yeah. Perloff. Um, he was definitely <laughs> from the Mac. And uh, he, he was on Hard Docs, and he had great. He was like the fourth quarterback on the team. Come on, you guys. He was to- from Toledo. I yeah, feel yeah, like. yeah. What's his name? And it's like. That's the connection. Oh, hold on. <laughs> He's like. Uh, he is basically. Na, 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 who can find it first? Do you guys ever listen to Mike Francesa? Whenever he was looking for a stat, he'd go, Eddie, get the book. And then he'd go <laughs> silent for a minute. <laughs> Eddie, get, get, the, get book. the book. And that'd be waiting for Eddie to get the book. <laughs> and does he <laughs> think there's an actual book or is he familiar with the internet? <laughs> we'll look this up during the break. Yeah. Andrew Perlow. No, we got to find this right now. Yeah, no, I'm staying on. He's, control, he's seized control of our clock. Oh, yeah. no. What is I don't Who is he waiting for? This is the most important thing. Do you have it? Yeah, you're right. He went to Toledo. We'll insert it We'll later. find it. We'll find it. Andrew Perloff, uh, are you still going by McLovin or no? Broken Roback. Oh, yes. Broken Dylan Roback. comes through. Yes, who is the Logan Woodside. He's like, they're, like, they're, they're interchangeable. Perloff, let us leave. We will, <laughs> we will continue to call him McLovin on this show. You know how clocks work, right? right? Dude, You're in Andrew radio. Perloff. I don't have a clock. He's been our guest. <laughs> Stay with us. More coming from Radio Road Super Bowl 56 across the Outkick Network.
from Los Angeles, Outkick 360 and Outkick.com with Fox. Been a fun uh, early portion of the week so far. Just getting started here all week leading up to Super Bowl 56. And FanDuel's got a great offer for you. FanDuel.com slash OK360. Your chance, an unbelievable opportunity to turn $5 into $280. 56 to 1 odds at FanDuel Sportsbook. If you're a first-time user, you can log on to FanDuel.com slash OK360. First-time users, you bet up to $5 on either the, the Rams or the Bengals to win Super Bowl 56. And FanDuel will boost your odds to an incredible 56 to 1, valid for new users only. It's a money line bet, so you're just picking a winner. You're not betting against the spread. FanDuel.com slash OK360. We'd be remiss if we didn't give a big thank you to Tony in L.A., uh, who has been a longtime friend of ours, friend of the show, um, and has stuck with us. And we had a chance to, to meet up with him last night. I met Tony for the first time. Uh, doing Titan sideline reporting on the road in Arizona. This was the trip where uh, they the, the Titans were staying and then going to play the 49ers. This was the end of Mike Malarkey. Yes, and I- exactly. And they, they stayed out in Arizona. And I met uh, Tony, who came down to like the first row and said hello. It was either at halftime or right after the game. And since then, he's kept in touch, and, and he travels a lot to Nashville for some of the home games. Uh, he'll pick one or two road games a year, uh, but but lives out here and took us to dinner last night. It was tremendous, and uh, we always love the day one season ticket holders for, for Outkick 360 slash midday 180, and Tony is at the front of the line. He showed us around SoFi, which I'd been to uh, a game at, but I had no idea the forum was right there, that the Clippers were building an arena right there, so he gave us a real sense of the lay of the land, which was it was awesome. And he treated us to dinner last night, yeah. too, which uh, we're, very we're very thankful, very generous of him. And we got the full Tony in L.A. tour uh, through where he grew up, right by SoFi Stadium. Uh, and that the new Clippers, I didn't even know it was being built, but the new Clippers either. venue looks incredible uh, with the plans for that. I went back and, and, and looked at the, the models of what they're going to make with that new Clippers venue, and it's, it's terrific. I said, but a huge shout-out to Tony. Who, uh, guy, there's so many venues here. I said, who's funding this? He said, well, ownership. So I said, Steve no, Ballmer yeah, is, is no, doing the whole thing. No beef with it when the owner's yeah, funding the whole, the whole project. Thing. That's the way it should work. Eric Weddle is riding the tidal wave <laughs> right now. Uh, he had re- been retired for nearly two years and signs on with the Rams because they were in desperate need of help at safety. Um, towards the end of the year, he signed on January 12th with the Los Angeles Rams. Again, nearly uh, out of football for nearly two years. And Weddle helps out with uh, a secondary that has been really banged up. Tyler Rapp uh, was out with a concussion for a couple of weeks. They've had um, Jordan Fuller out with an ankle injury. Anyway, he comes in and barely plays in that first matchup of the postseason. But as you start to look, he played in 19 of 56 defensive snaps against the Arizona Cardinals. But Weddle, he played in all 51 snaps two weeks ago in the NFC Championship game in that three-point victory over the 49ers. And he's been in the league now 15 years um, and, well, excuse me, 13 years, 15 years total if you count now him getting signed. Um, nearly two years into retirement, and he's going to play in the in the Super Bowl for the first time. It's a, a terrific story, and I, I mean, it, and the way he's declared, like I, I'm playing this game and going back to my regular life, which is far removed from my playing career. It's, it was, uh, it, you know, it's a movie. Well, and it's also um, it's a little strange, a little weird how it all worked out. He he would keep in touch with players on the Rams roster. Of course, he's a longtime Charger. Um, he would keep in touch with players on the Rams roster, and he watched all the Rams games and broke down the film this year. What but prompted that? He was, I, I, again, like I, I think there may have been one or maybe two teams he would consider playing for based on where he was living. He was playing full-court basketball to stay in shape, apparently like an, an extremely competitive league, and that was it. And then get signed January 12th, and now he's playing in the Super Bowl. I mean, I'm not surprised that a guy like that could do that, but I think he's like a top-shelf 
kind of guy. And he's always been a terrifically smart player, uh, you know. And I don't know that you know how well does he run. I don't. I don't know if they they play in a way that you could cover for him not being able to run great anymore. It's a great endorsement for rec league basketball. Yeah, that you can stay in good enough shape doing that to go play in the NFL Sign and, and be up productive. At his Absolutely, league. and also uh, what a lifeline. I mean, to have a chance to go win a Super Bowl uh, at this point in his career, two years removed from, from playing, thinking you're retired. Yeah, it's really it's it's an unbelievable story. And now you know gets the chance to win the win the title for the first time and he he, he played for good teams too yeah, I mean, yeah. he played for chargers teams that were ravens. good and he played for ravens teams that were good yeah and then it, so he in his initial press conference whenever they had him back he was on virtual or whatever he he told one of the reporters a reporter was asking him like why why do you think you can still play you've been out of the league two years like how desperate are the rams and he he admitted he goes that is a very fair question and then he barely played against the Cardinals. But, again, two weeks ago, every snap against the 49ers. Now, a different aerial attack this week if he's in there. And we'll find out more about the injury report for the Rams later I, this week. I would have said to that question of what he said, but then I would have also said, I refer your question to Sean McVay and Les Snead. He kind of just said, yeah. like, well, they, we'll They put a out. contract in front of me. We'll find out. Um, and more power to him. I, I, I think it's a really cool story, and that will be – that will be among the eight hours of pregame coverage oh, yeah. for NBC They'll Super Bowl do coverage a touching, for sure. A touching portrait of, yes. uh, of him. And here's a big, uh, an, maybe one of the top stories is Odell Beckham Jr., um, a free agent with Cleveland. Um, they release him. He is able to go and sign. He doesn't have to go on waivers based on where he is in the league, so he gets to cherry pick his team, and he chooses the Rams over the Packers. And at the time... He also talked about the Saints. At the I, time, I saw something with him this week where he said Saints were in play. It was... Uh, I think most people would lean towards, oh, you could, you're teaming up with Aaron Rodgers for sure. Yep. You know, you team up with Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers and off you go. And he made the, the perfect decision. He so who knows? Maybe, maybe he would have helped. I, I, mean, I, I don't know that he would have played special teams that day and helped the, the Packers on that front, but the Packers didn't, didn't score... Uh, the way they should have well, after the was, first drive, right? He might have helped the Packers. This is get when the, there too. the biggest surprise: the Rams were struggling at that point. I mean, it, it, not just Aaron Rodgers; it was the Packers were much better, much more well positioned in their season in November when Odell Beckham Jr. decided to go to the Rams. So that was also a surprising part of it. But here he is now playing for a Super Bowl, and he was he also. I mean, he didn't land there and explode like everybody wanted, right? It was a gradual thing. Uh, and the Rams had some struggles at, yep. at that stage of their season. He's another one of those guys that's a testament that should remind all of us, and I think we pride ourselves on not overreacting, though it's the nature of the business to have an immediate reaction. But for fans out there who are, you know, uh, uh, always overreacting, um, he, he's kind of a model. Like, if you're bringing in a guy like that, that's really a more realistic expectation of how it can happen and what they're looking for. Um, and and they got, they've gotten the best out of it. Now he's got a chance to, to be a, a, a big contributor there. Also, I think it says a lot about his second act, or his third act, really, yeah. because he, he looked like a malcontent in Cleveland. His dad's chirping, all that stuff comes. Then he comes to a team where he's not the singular savior. Cooper Cup is the guy. He needs to be a supplementary part and seems satisfied with it. It's, it's been a good supplementary role. Look, we talk again and again every day. We hit on the, the weaponry and the, and the firepower and the playmakers. There's room for more than one. Once upon a time, you could have, you know, one dominant receiver. But it's, that's no more. You need more than one, and he's certainly testament to that now. It, it's a great story right now, and it is. It's an example of what, even when you think someone's done from an attitude standpoint and they can't get along with anyone and they're not going to be a productive teammate again, that they can be, and this is an example of that happening. A lot of them aren't. He's also one father tweet rant away from being back, uh, in, that. Being back in that same category. You're absolutely right. He, he could, his dad could go after Matthew Stafford like he went after, after Eli Manning, and like he went after Baker Mayfield also, uh, if he's not getting enough touches. I don't think that's going to happen, but that's also that's kind of the, that's the game you play when you bring on Odell Beckham Jr. And it's worked, and it, it's, it's good evidence for teams, hey, maybe he, he's not done. 
Maybe he will, if he gets in the right spot, will get along with his teammates better, will be a better teammate. And we've seen that with, with Beckham Jr. Uh, it's interesting what you say. His production's not quite it's – not, it's not completely parallel. But right now, it's it's kind of the Antonio Brown story, right? If they, if they win, he came in, he helped. Next year, I, I don't know his contract status is. I think they would have to re-sign him the way that the Bucks yep. had to re-sign Antonio yep. Brown. And you would expect it to continue. But, Chad, like you say, it could go the other direction. Who knows? You know, he could but none be of that the matters opposite. if they win the Super Bowl. Right. He could be if he the helps opposite. them win a Super Bowl, who cares? Much like Antonio Brown. Well, though, though we cared this year about Antonio Brown's behavior, and the Bucks cared, and it was their we undoing cared. when they might have repeated. It but, was part of their undoing. But ask the Bucks if it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> it was worth it. Yeah, it, it was worth it for sure. But when they had a path to maybe go do it again, it screwed them. So it was worth it that they got the one, but also hurt them when they maybe could have gone and got the two. Well, they are rolling right now with Beckham because he had his first 100-yard game since 2019, October 13th, 2019. That came in the NFC Championship game. He had his first game with nine or more catches for the first time since 2018. Here's a question for you. You get to watch one guy. You ISO camera on this warm-up. Who's, the, who's your guy? Mine might be Odell Beckham because I know he's going to make a bunch of crazy one-handers. I'll go with your answer. <laughs> Good answer. Coming up, headlines of the day, including Kyler Murray. And is he about to join the circus that is the quarterback movement this offseason? We'll lead there from Super Bowl 56 Radio Row across the Outkick Network at Outkick 360.
Final hours here, Tuesday edition, Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. And here is in Los Angeles, Super Bowl 56 coming up on Sunday as the Bengals take on the Rams. We're live from Radio Row here at the L.A. Convention Center, which is connected to like three or four other buildings around here, around the, the block. you got the Microsoft Center. You've got, uh, of course, the arena was the Staples Center, now Crypto.com Arena. There, we, we were trying to survey all of the venues that are in a, a two-block radius of this place. Hutton has been very big on wanting to know where the Grammys take place and if that's where the Grammys he likes are. Nice he, wants, he wants to see where the red carpet the would Grammys be for the like Grammys. The, 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 all of the award season, which is coming up. There's right? a Dolby Theater that I hear about that I feel like something, one of the award shows is always at the Dolby Theater. Maybe that's... Maybe that's the Grammys. And yesterday when we grabbed food right after the show, we saw the backside, uh, for us, the backside of the Staples Center, crypto whatever center, um, saw the statues of the famous Kings, famous Lakers. The Shaq, uh, I hate Shaq, but the Shaq statue is the best because it's him hanging from the rim, pulling up his feet. It's very, very good. Very uh, unique, and it, it, it exemplifies exactly what he did for them. Yeah. yeah well, the, they didn't have. They didn't want to the do a statue of, of him missing a free throw. That would have been less uh, less impressive. And then Paul, very nonchalantly, after he goes down to take a picture, and we walk away, goes, "Hey, that was Pharrell down there by he, the he, arena. He was just over here. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't not hear him. Have you guys not heard him both times? He was just where he was doing the Nestor. Oh, you're talking about uh, Pharrell from uh, Sirius XM? Yeah. Oh, I haven't. I haven't seen him. He was under the shock statue talking. You couldn't not hear him. I couldn't believe you guys didn't I was, hear him. I'm talking about Pharrell Williams. No, no. that's not who he's talking about. Oh, he's well, about the th- sports host Pharrell. I he have no like idea who. Grainy voice. I, apologies if I hear Pharrell and I think Pharrell Williams. I have no idea who the sports host is you're talking about. Hutton knows. Yeah, he, yeah, he's the show of hands over here. If you hear, I heard Pharrell. You would hear his voice from anywhere. Who were you thinking about? The Grammy Award-winning, very famous musician, or a sports host from Sirius XM? Are, are, a Thank show you. of hands. Are we in a sports talk environment or an environment well, where I would LA. see Pharrell Williams? We're in Los Angeles, Paul. I would say, though, uh, the, the voice is way more recognizable as the sports host. Thank you. I have no idea who you're talking about. I, I'm totally honest. Never heard of this person. He, he probably was on our like old station doing like uh, the show after ours at times or something. He could. I, I, maybe so. Uh, we've got new stations to talk about, though. Uh, shout out to Sports oh, Radio do. 104.7, the Upper Cumberland. Uh, also, WBFG 96.5, the sports, vo- uh, sports voice for West Tennessee. Fox Sports Shoals in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, in Florence, Alabama, in Huntsville. We say hello to you today from L.A. and um, Somo Sports Radio in Missouri. You can find us online just by searching out Outkick 360 on all the social platforms. and You can view the show in clips by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by visiting Outkick.com. Um, so we, we mentioned earlier Brady, uh, Tom Brady with the comments on the Let's Go podcast yesterday, it dropped yesterday where he, he does not put a bow on the retirement decision. In fact, he leaves the door open by saying, you know, who knows how I'm going to feel in six months. Or, you know, I, I do feel like I made the right decision in the moment and in the moment right now. But how am I going to feel later? How am I going to feel football season-wise? Don't know. And so it, it's hard not to read into that. It's also hard not to read into the, uh, well, I, he may not be upset. It may be a posturing for a contract extension as you start to see what's left for Kyler Murray uh, contractually with the Cardinals. But he has scrubbed all of his social media clean of any reference to the Cardinals. That includes photos that he would have posted on Instagram. And it's amazing how uh, fans or media members will be able to figure this out. You know, you have to, it takes more than one person to realize that all this stuff is gone. But it also takes a concerted effort on his part to remove it. What are we, four weeks at least, removed from their very poor playoff performance? So do we think we're just noticing this and he did it relatively soon after that, or we think this is relatively I, I, recent I think to someone know. caught it pretty quickly when he decided to scrub every, so it's every odd mention to me. of the Cardinals from It wouldn't from have been account. odd to me if an immature guy did this relatively quickly after a very disappointing loss at the end of a season that really went south when you were 10-1 and one or whatever you were 
and then things took a turn. It'd be very odd for me if he's doing it, like, in the last couple days. It's also a very easy troll opportunity. If you're the least bit unhappy or just want to get people talking, you, you could go and do this and make it happen. I, I don't know if that's the case with him. You know, I, I liken it to the college football coach who suddenly follows players on a roster when there's coaching movement going on. Yes. Right? You always hear about that. Look at this coach who just followed or this recruit who followed this, this defensive coordinator or this coach. Oh, suddenly they're following all the players in this roster or recruits for another team, and it gets people talking about that. Um, it's such an intentional move to go and do that that there's clearly something behind it. We don't know if it's ultimately he's going to be asking out, but clearly unhappy. I have no other idea. What would the explanation be? If, you, if someone reached Kyler Murray for comment and said, why did you do this? Just I, I don't want to associate with one team. I'm completely happy, though. With the, I, I don't know why you would take it down. No reason. I'm trying to come not, up with an explanation. Yeah, 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 there's well, no he's, reason. He's about to go into uh, an extensive contract negotiation where they're either going to try to get the best for the Cardinals uh, price-wise or they're going to slap that fifth-year option on him, which they can do this offseason. He's, he's coming off of year three. He's a first-round uh, number one pick uh, from 2019, so he's going to have the fifth-year option. And – they can either do that or extend his contract because he's also eligible for a contract extension right now. The, the difference um, in, in, look, this isn't uncommon. It, it's, it's very common to see these, these quarterbacks have the fifth-year option. We saw it with Patrick Mahomes and we saw it with Josh Allen. At the very least, it's insurance. Um, it's insurance, but they also signed massive contract extensions before they even got close to their fifth year. And it's, it would seem that while Murray should expect he's going to have that slapped on his the the backside of his contract, I, I think this is a uh, it, more or less a message sent like, "Hey, let's let's get this going now and not sooner rather than let's later. Let's not kick this can down the street or down the road. At least that's that's my read into it. Uh, if he's disgruntled and you're thinking about moving him, uh, well, this would be the off season to do that too because yeah. you're trading a quarterback that's going into year four. A, a, a rookie contract that is very attainable for another team, and Paul poo-poo's any trade whatsoever. <laughs> but we're in the we're in the era of trades in the NFL now, like we've never seen before. If I'm the Cardinals, I would simply say, "Hey, you're our guy. We have every intention of dealing with you, but we have other more pressing contract deadlines and an off season with deadlines that we have to deal with first. Um, and we have every intention of getting to you. I would. I wouldn't necessarily do it this off season. I would do it after next season. I still have control of you for the fifth season. Uh, that number will be big, and I'd like to negotiate a, a long term deal before your fifth season. It In the does, meantime, I get to see the sense. fourth season. Because if you pick up the fifth year option, Paul, it is now one hundred percent guaranteed. Right, after, but it doesn't touch my cap until that fifth season. I'll get it down before if, that fifth. But season. But if you're going to move him, you you move him now. Well, I've got no interest in moving him. Well, why not? What if you can get Aaron Rodgers there? Well, yeah, and in okay. that sense, I'd have interest in moving him. But, but that's I, that's a move. That that would be the move. Is you talk about? You no, know, the Titans could never get the Packers to take Ryan Tannehill and his contract. Well, would the Packers take Kyler Murray Hell on yeah. a rookie deal? Hell yeah. Yes. If Aaron Rodgers is unhappy? Again. Would the Tampa Bay Buccaneers yes. take on that contract if Tom Brady feels like Arizona is a better spot to go win a Super Bowl? Sure. Let's get, let's get wild. Let's get crazy this offseason. No, Why not? All, all these things. Wild. This is, I think this is the new norm. Where you're, uh, Quarterbacks taking autonomy over everything is well, certainly we're heading in but, that direction. But – uh, the quarterbacks who are able to drive that conversation make this happen. I don't know if Kyler Murray is at that level. No. Um, but I watched that playoff game, and I don't put much of that performance on Kyler Murray. I put that squarely on the decision-making and game plan of Cliff Kingsbury, which I, I thought was atrocious. I don't know what he's particularly upset with. I mean, I, I think that's a team that was about where, like we said, the Bengals were ahead of schedule this year. That's about what I, I – I mean, I didn't expect it to be so jarring like well, that's what a, it's been a every patch year. of winning and a patch of losing. Yeah, that's what they've done. But the they, they, they've gotten better 
They're he's a year a ahead of, of where the Cincinnati should be. Well, and, and they're, they're they're going they're coming off of three years with the head coach and the quarterback together. Yeah, and we just talked about why he he, their, he may it's be his mad. franchise. I think he's in in shape with it as his franchise. And if I were him, I'd say this is my franchise but, to take. But here forward. again, here here it is. It's my franchise. Let's negotiate the extension now right. and get out ahead of this. And if the Cardinals come back and say no. We're going to go into a prove it situation. Then he's going to be upset. Yeah. I, I would. That, that's why. That's why he would take it down I, and be I upset. I understand that, but I yeah. I would massage it as best I could as the Cardinals, as it not being a prove it situation, as it being a I have pressing stuff I have to deal with ahead of you that has deadlines on it, and you deadlines could, are, are the thing that make me order things. You can also you may be able to get him for a cheaper price if you extend him right earlier. Now. Maybe coming off of year three, where they've you know well, they've they've really gone downhill to close both of the last two seasons. We also know how the market uh, works from year to year, and the 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 price of a long term quarterback contract this year will seem outrageous, yeah. and then next year, last year's contract will seem far less outrageous. Well, and all the the situation with Kingsbury, you're in a, entering a season where it can be viewed d- definitely a prove it season for Cliff Kingsbury as the coach, but also possibly. For Kyler Murray, well, and the, and they're together line, right now. Well, yeah, but their storyline, to me, it, they've just reset the storyline that was August of 2021. It was a prove it year where they needed to put things together between offensive play caller and quarterback. Whenever they made the decision to draft Kyler Murray number one overall, and and move on from previous mistakes in the first round, and more power to them on that, but. At some point, that tandem's got to produce. And I think based on the way they finished the season with the losing streak and falling flat and then with that terrible performance against the Rams, we now start next season exactly with the same narrative that yep. we had for them this year, despite them being the last remaining unbeaten team in the NFL in the regular season. They're stuck in a little quicksand, uh, maybe a little less deep. Yeah, but, you know, they, they've got some nice pieces, but... I don't blame Murray for doing whatever he can to get the extension right now with some security. Well, look, if I'm Murray, too, though, I like what they did last offseason in terms of moves. Yes. Uh, or, or the last couple of years. I mean, the yeah. Andre Hopkins trade was a, was a great move. Going and getting uh, A.J. Green, uh, who was productive. People, A lot of people thought he, he was done. He turned out to be a good move. J.J. Watt. You know, broke down as you'd expect. Made it back for the playoff game to some degree. I, I don't mind that, but you know, if I'm him, I like that move. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like their they're a go for it. They were it's a, going a good for it's it. a good roster, but they're in an an odd spot in that division That's right a now. Tough division. That was the NFC Championship game in their division. Two teams there. Then you've got Seattle, who looks like they may be going into sort of a rebuilding mode now. You've got Russell Wilson wanting out, and they're kind of that. Third team behind Rams, 49ers, but maybe not behind those teams. 49ers are going to be breaking in a new quarterback next year, a high pick in Trey Lance, but where do they fit in that pecking order? Clearly behind the Rams. Right now behind the 49ers, but they're transitioning to a new quarterback ahead of the Seahawks right now from a roster standpoint, but in a weird way, sort of no man's land right now for Arizona. Yeah, they've got some kind of slippery footing. I think it's a, it's an important year for them, and he could feel you know doubted, no matter what what they're telling him. But it doesn't strike me as the most mature thing to take a take it public, uh, and b take it public in a way where you're taking their logo off your stuff and whatnot. It was all but like two of them. It, he had a photo of uh, him. Was it Ceedee Lamb that he left up? It was, was Ceedee Lamb or another receiver with the Cowboys. You don't want to disrespect and then disrespect there was a, CD. A pro a, a pro day um, or a Pro Bowl uniform with the Cardinals logo on it as well. That was it. That's all he left up. It's a very young athlete in 2022 way to go about your business to yeah. show you're unhappy well, to works. remove photos from Instagram. But it works. I mean, yeah. it's a it's it got, the second it, headline in the league behind Brady today. Got everyone talking. He he made his point because it's got everyone buzzing about it. It's a lot different than uh, Joe Burrow would handle a similar situation, um, you know, at a even younger, yeah, I mean, younger I, age. You're right about that too. Um, a little less pressure on Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow in that combo. They've hit the fast forward button. Yeah, with uh, Zach Taylor in year two with Burrow. 
making it to the Super Bowl. But it strikes me as a, a immature way of going about things, not knowing the full context of, of, of everything. Hit us up on Twitter at Outkick360 and stay tuned. We return live to Los Angeles next across the Outkick Network.
lot of coaching movement across the NFL. Outkick 360 rolls on across the Outkick network from Super Bowl 56 Radio Row in Los Angeles with Chad Withrow and Paul Koharski. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Um, among the news in coaching is what the Titans have done to extend theirs. They've uh, made it official. They've come to uh, terms on a contract extension for Mike Vrabel and for general manager John Robinson. Their contracts were running concurrent at that point, and, and it's a no-brainer. We discussed it during the regular season that the, the Titans would end up doing this uh, because it turned into a weekly bit where we would find out, you know, if uh, Eli Drinkwitz was making more than Mike Vrabel, and the answer was yes. Hopefully the answer is now no. And uh, based on Vrabel's uh, job and the body of work, he deserves to be a top-10 paid NFL coach right now across the entire league. He was the Pro Football Writers of America Coach of the Year, and Thursday night, odds, uh, I think he's the odds-on favorite to win uh, – the main coach of the year award, the Associated Press Coach of the Year award, which will be revealed with MVP and Offensive and Defensive Player of the Year and all of that. Uh, a heck of a tandem they've been. Uh, John Robinson got a two-year head start here, but collectively uh, they've put together a 41-24 and 24 record. Uh, they just won back-to-back division titles for the first time in franchise history since the inaugural year and the follow-up year, 1960. And 1961 in the AFL, time with different meaning, obviously. Yep. And while they've not gotten broken through in the playoffs in the last two years, uh, three consecutive uh, playoff berths, they're, they're a factor. In John Robinson's tenure, the, the, the six years, only Kansas City's won, uh, won more games. Uh, that's pretty damn good. And, and listen, the Titans are not historically the most stable team in the league. They are one of the most stable teams in the league now because of those two guys. Yeah, and, and the contract extension is important. And Hunt, I think you said deserves to be a top 10 paid coach in the league. I would completely agree with that, yeah. especially for a guy who on Thursday night, as you mentioned, Paul, is probably going to be the coach of the year. Um, the stability with the Titans is great. Uh, they need the way win. the season ended <laughs> – Look, I mean, he, he needs the extension. You know, Mike Vrabel needs to be around, but to me that's the next road to cross. Yeah, he's not satisfied. For the, for the Titans. And I know he's not satisfied, and John Robinson isn't either, but the whole, all the questions around quarterback to yeah. me are going to cloud. These guys, Titans fans should be thrilled. They're both locked up. But what's going to dominate this offseason for that team is going to be doubts about Ryan Tannehill and the more John Robinson doubles and triples down on he is our quarterback, end of discussion type talk, the more people are going to fight back on that notion. And things, look, things may be changing, right? We, we could see a crazy offseason and, uh, in quarterback movement, and things may be changing in terms of quarterback movement. But the Titans are, in the, in the old way, a stuck team at quarterback where you're good. Uh, so it's very difficult to get the kind of draft position that you need to to go the traditional route to draft a star quarterback. You would have to give up a bunch of draft picks to move up far enough. Then you're sacrificing a lot of draft capital, which they value, though they haven't used first-rounders very well. And you get stuck in this place where you're good enough to consistently go to the playoffs. You're not good enough to advance in the playoffs. And there you are. What do you do about quarterback? A lot of inventive things we're talking about, though some handcuff potential cap stuff with Ryan Tannehill, who three years ago they judged accurately as being really good for, for what but, they did. But also, most off-seasons, you know, trades are more normal now yes. ac- across the league, but most off-seasons, all the conversation would be, do you sacrifice an entire draft to move up in the first round and draft a quarterback? And that's it. That's your option at quarterback. More now. This guy's not ever going to get it done. Let's go find the guy that will in the draft. Now we're looking at a possible unprecedented offseason where Aaron Rodgers is going to be available for someone if they can make a trade. Russell Wilson, add to that list. Possibly Kyler Murray. Possibly Tom Brady, if we're going to listen to his talk about I don't know where I'll be in six months if he decides that he wants to get traded also. So that's not going to hold this year. Well, I, got, I don't think you're in a situation where there's just no options at all. 
you can try to make it work. You might be right. I think Aaron Rodgers is going to wind up staying. I think Russell Wilson is going to wind up staying. There's still, you're, you've got a list there with with options, and it and, and there could still be a lot a lot of moves. Well, there say are this. more alternatives than there've ever been. More possibilities. Well, you, can, you can think that about those guys. Not everyone is going to stay. There's going to be something that happens, and someone's going to upgrade the quarterback position, and the Titans could get in line to be one of those teams that does that. And John Robinson, for his deficiencies that we talk about a lot, uh, he's, he's, uh, particularly first-round failures, has made some pretty good trades. Uh, I mean, this would be the blockbuster of all blockbusters, but the getting Tannehill trade was a hell of a trade. Absolutely. He got DeMarco Murray, which was a hell of a trade. He got Dennis Kelly, who's no huge deal in league circles, but he got him for a guy who's going to cut in Doriel Green-Beckham. He, he's worked the trade market pretty effectively so far. Now, can he put a cherry on top of that with something here? Again, the, the cap constraints are going to be a big part of that. I'd like to see how quickly, though, something that was one of their biggest strengths in their offensive line could become a huge weakness for this team. Well, they're aging at some because spots. Because they're, they're they are on the, the edge of that happening very quickly and not just some gradual decline. They could go from that being something that you go into every week saying, well, the offensive line is going to be good to, oh, boy, Let's not give up 11 sacks in this game. Or can the Titans even get a, a ground game going? That could happen quickly. Well, we saw them go from really good offensive line overall to iffy pass protection line, good run blocking line. And like you're saying, the next thing is gone all to, together yep. yeah. conceivably. They've got to make a couple changes there. How dramatic do they go? What do they do with expenditures? What do they do with draft capital? And I think... All of Nashville, Hutton, you, you very uh, smartly brought up all of Nashville being united about Ryan Tannehill now. I think... Uh, well, there's all, just no all, excuse other than pointing to the quarterback play. The last couple of off-seasons, whenever you bowed out, it was, well, AFC Championship game with the amazing run, right, where they won on the road, went to Arrowhead, and that team maxed out. No, regardless of how they played and what the offense did or did not do, they were up 10 points, 17-7, on the road in Arrowhead. And Patrick Mahomes and company pulled the comeback, scored before halftime off of a turnover, I believe, and then, you know, that was all she wrote. Then Kansas City goes on to win the Super Bowl. Uh, last year it was about the horrible third down defense and the just atrocious play defensively where the offense was putting up all types of record numbers in 2020. And this year it was the offense and more specifically it was play calling and quarterback because the run game – Got it done without Derrick Henry. They need a, a home run with that first-round pick or with what they do with that first-round pick because that's another thing people are united on is this lack of production out of first-round picks with very few exceptions. And yeah. uh, they don't have a second-round pick this year. So it makes it even, uh, even more uh, important. But with all that being said, they, I think that the reason for optimism is exactly what they did today by extending – these two guys. And I mean, the division. I mean, they, they can coast through right. this division at least for another year, right? While Houston and Jacksonville seem rudderless. They One hired a good coach but has a iffy GM situation and bad talent. The other hired a coach that we're all like, what are they doing? They have no plan. And they, they have to offload a quarterback that they don't know what to do. And the Colts ended things so badly that the owner has, has become the mouthpiece and is tweeting regularly about things and they have a bigger quarterback question than the Titans. This team's going to win the division again. The question is, what does it do when it gets in the playoffs? In that regard, like, let's go off the air and check back with us uh, next <laughs> January regarding the Titans. Yeah, this team will not be judged until next, next playoff. Yeah, I mean, they, they went from an overachieving team two years ago to make that run of the AFC Championship to back-to-back -back years where they underachieved based on expectation. And check in because in early you were judged by what you do yep. in the postseason. Look, it's nice to have a, a nice autumn where you go win a division, and, and you're winning more games than you're losing over the course of the season. That's not a bad thing for Titans fans or for that organization, but it matters what you do in the postseason. It matters if you can win in January, and now we've got firm evidence in back-to-back -back years. Titans can't win a home game uh, in January, and th yeah. that's a problem. And it Again, it starts at the quarterback position to me, and until they figure that out, I think the Titans are going to go win the division again next year and probably lose a home playoff game. John McClain said it earlier when we were talking about uh, the, the addition of Tim Kelly. You know, maybe he, he said it pretty simply. Maybe he can help figure uh, Ryan Tannehill figure out how to throw fewer interceptions. 
And that interception number rose and rose. He turned the ball over 21 times in 18 games. All these quarterbacks we're talking about in this impressive quarterback boom, particularly in the AFC, nobody's turning the ball over 21 times in 18 games and having success. It's remarkable Ryan Tannehill had the success he had despite that. Well, and also, you know, Derrick Henry's not going to be Derrick Henry forever. And he, got, he had a, suffered a bad injury this year, so odds are he may drop off some next season. And when he's not the engine for that offense and they're going to rely on Tannehill to up his game and make everyone else around him better, what's the confidence that he's going to be able to do that? Mm-hmm. When he's given the football a lot more to make plays, even with good weapons around him, I, I don't have a lot of faith that he's going to elevate that team if and when Derrick Henry starts to drop off. More passes he throws, hot, the worse they do, generally speaking. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. And the, the thing about Tannehill, too, is he threw more interceptions this year than the previous two seasons combined. Um, so, I mean, there's just uh, – to me, it, that, that can – come in play design that can come in players on the field but ultimately the best quarterbacks aren't turning the football over um joe burrow gets sacked more than ryan Tannehill, and he's running for his life he's not turning the football over in the critical portions of the season and on their last pass of the season are they throwing it to khalif raymond and nick westbrook akina no i mean the Bengals have three legitimate receiving options and they're all on the field right and, 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 you know, the Nick Westbrook-Akina play that we're, we've talked about over and over, he had two better players conceivably. Man, I don't know about that. Well, Julio uh, Jones wasn't on the field for some right. reason. But he had players open elsewhere. You've got to get to a point where the, on the roster, and this, this you know, involves going and finding a speed receiver and drafting a tight end more than likely, but to where you're in that situation late game and there's not a single receiving option on the field that when thrown the ball to, you're going to say, Really? They chose Nick Westbrook Aquina in that moment? The goal is to not have that option on the field in those moments to where, you know, if Tyler Boyd catches the pass for Cincinnati or you're, you're throwing an interception directed at him, no one's saying, why are you throwing to Tyler Boyd? Well, I don't have a problem throwing the NWI if he's open. But when he's double covered and the third guy's arriving as the ball arrives and there are two other guys, if you freeze the frame, who are open – uh, then I'm questioning the quarterback's decision making less than the receivers. I mean, but Nick Westbrook Akin is put on the field. It's not his fault that he drew the cover. If you're throwing a pass with 18 seconds him. left in the game to try to get in field goal range to kick a, a last second field goal to go to the playoffs, Nick Westbrook Akin cannot be on the field. Well, I, yeah, that, I mean, but that's not. Can't be on the field. Fault. And it's not Nick Westbrook Akin's fault right. either. Yeah. But we'll that, that can't be the, an option. Throw on the it play. To the, uh, but also well, throw it to the open guy. I mean, the, let's just yeah, go through the, on that play. Let, let's go through the the list of weapons. You know, coaches like to say they're only as good as their players. In the, in the and Vrabel says that in the marquee moments, you're going to your you're going to your stars, right? Think about uh, Kansas City. Kansas City's not throwing to Pringle with the game on the line. Yeah. Uh, Joe Burrow's not going to throw to Stanley Morgan with the game on the line. Yeah. In that Cincinnati Titans game, who did he go to when he needed the 16 or the 19 yards to get in field goal range right after that Tannehill interception? Jamar Chase. Boom. And Jamar Chase, that was his only catch beyond the line of scrimmage that day. And it worked. It won the game. Hey, they it put him, him in anyway. a 15 year, a 52 yard field goal. That won and it looks so easy. Oh, yeah. Going back to that play in that moment, None it looked very it easy for Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. To make get that many yards to get in field goal range looked very easy. And that's the difference right there. None of us had a doubt that Joe Burrow was going to get the yards he needed for a good field goal attempt there. Meanwhile, after Ryan Tannehill's very first pass, all of us had a doubt the whole yeah. afternoon about what Ryan Tannehill was going to be able to do because he threw a pick, a bad pick, one of three bad picks on the damn first pass play of the Titans afternoon. Well, real quick, keep keep in mind the the – the Titans lost by a field goal, and they turned it over with their quarterback three times. That's the positive way of looking at it. With nine sacks. Um, and, and Chad's right. Burrow and Chase made it look easy. He didn't say it made it look pretty. That was an ugly win, but they won in advance. They have not played up to their full potential throughout this entire playoff run. But the key is the quarterback is not losing games. Burrow's not stepping up and making those types of throws that we saw against Baltimore and Pittsburgh and other teams throughout the year. We haven't seen that Joe Burrow yet or that version of this Cincinnati offense, but he's not playing like Ryan Tannehill. And that's the difference in the two teams. The Titans are better roster-wise and, uh, quite frankly, better coaching. And so not that day. That day, they, 
they ran into a, a Bengals team that played with more of the mentality and stressed the factors that Brable preaches more than the veteran quarterback that was starting for the third consecutive season in the postseason for the Tennessee Titans. That's exactly right. That's the fear of Ryan Tannehill moving forward. In the biggest moment, he plays small. And on the opposite sideline, the guy rises to the occasion no matter how the day's going. And look, Drabel's a great find-a-way coach. We talked about this. Cincinnati in that game was the team that found a way despite the nine sacks and all of that. Yeah. Can't, I think the question this season may well be, this coming season for the Tennessee Titans, can he find a way with Ryan Tannehill, with well, Tim Kelly helping? And hopefully that's with the, the addition of Tim Kelly and the double tight end sets that we could see. Uh, Chad, you're looking at a story, I believe, with Alvin Kamara. Have they released a statement? Yes, they have. I'm also looking at Josh Palmer, uh, who's here, former Tennessee Vol and current Los oh. Angeles Charger. Um, Alvin, so this is from three attorneys, the law office for Alvin Kamara representing him. Alvin Kamara has gained a well-deserved reputation for being a hardworking and community-minded individual. The recent Las Vegas allegations are not consistent with who Mr. Kamara has shown himself to be in both his public and private life. Therefore, we are conducting our own investigation into all of the circumstances and individuals associated with this matter to determine both the facts and motivations of all involved. I actually speak lawyer, guys. Yeah, go ahead. So let me go ahead and translate this Please for do. you. He's on video punching a man eight times, exactly like the cop said. So let's get to the bottom of what provoked our upstanding citizen to attack a man outside of an elevator in Las Vegas. That is the official translation from the attorneys. Who were all parties involved? What was motivation with this? Everything else. So now is where we get to the part of the story that claims the victim in this story either rightfully or wrongly was doing something that he should not have been doing that provoked a fight. And uh, the uh, media members uh, throughout this morning were confirming that the Las Vegas police let the NFL know about these charges well before, well before kickoff on Sunday. Of the, I, I don't understand. Do we call it a kickoff? That. Yeah, I mean, they did kick the ball. <laughs> do, do they then have a throw-off? Yeah. Remember that? Like when you played in the backyard, no one could really kick that right. well, so you'd throw it as far as you could Wing to start the game. Right, which was never very impressive. your backyard tackle football Not a game. very impressive throw most of the time either. I, I you saw the wrong guy throwing. Them. I saw a few more uh, highlights of that. I mean, there was, Mac Jones was called down on one play. It, a couple of people touched Paul, him. He resist. sure as hell was not down. Resist, Paul. Resist the urge to watch a highlight. <laughs> don't do it. it was just Even if it's on, on your Twitter background. feed, just don't do it. It was on in the back. The algorithm's going to get you. The algorithm will get you. The ratings will go up, and this thing will continue exactly this way forever. We, we saw Cam Jordan today, and there was a chance we were going to get him on. I was going to ask him about his two assists in that game. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cam Jordan, I think that's his seventh straight Pro Bowl. It's Cam amazing. Jordan. He had two assists. The, uh, the well, uh, can you have a tackle in the game? I, how well, can you have an assist? assist? How can you <laughs> in, re assist. in researching Cam Jordan? By the way, uh, today the best story is that the Cleveland Browns thought he was Jordan Cameron. <laughs> they flipped the name Jordan Cameron, a tight end they drafted in the fifth round. They called Cameron Jordan on draft day, and he was in a car going to the airport to go report to New Orleans as the first round pick. The Browns called him and said, hey, uh, welcome. You're going to be a Cleveland Brown. We're about to draft you. He thought he was in and he said, round? I'm good. I've already been taken. <laughs> and then they just silenced on the other end, and they realized they were calling Cameron Jordan first-round pick, oh. not Jordan Cameron, a tight end that was going to be and their pick in the fifth round. they didn't realize he was off the board, a guy of that caliber? No, they knew he was off the board, Paul. They thought they were. there were two different guys. Oh. One guy's name was Jordan Cameron, I believe a white tight end, Cameron Jordan is an African-American defensive end from Cal. They were calling Jordan Cameron, who they were drafting, but somehow oh, thought it was Cameron Jordan. I got you. And called Cameron Jordan. Hey, we'll see I you. Hey, I did we that. play you guys this season? I love that story <laughs> so much. A couple of uh, just uh, quick coaching news across the NFL. The Steelers have promoted Terrell Austin to their defensive coordinator position. He takes place of Keith Butler, who recently retired. That's a, how funny is that? that? We got to know Dick LeBeau when he kind of had a forced retirement and wound up working in, in Nashville for the Titans. They forced him out to make room for Keith Butler. We're so old, Keith Butler's now retired. <laughs> the, uh, that's right. The, the Raiders have officially hired Patrick Graham as their defensive coordinator. Um, let's see. The Colts have hired Gus Bradley 
Uh, he will replace Iberflus as the defensive coordinator in Indianapolis. Anthony Lynn was hired over the weekend. He's now the run game coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. And whenever they hired him, I tweeted out, that this is a sign that they believe Mike McDaniel's getting the Miami job. They made that official yesterday. And the Ravens uh, have their president, Dick Cass. He is retiring. So they have hired Sashi Brown as their new president of the Baltimore Ravens. He, of course, was with the Cleveland Browns. He's been a big part of what's gone on there, uh, you know, in terms of their organizational stability. So that, that'll be interesting to, to see what goes on there. But they leave their football people to do their football stuff, and DaCosta and Harbaugh are obviously very good. Coming up, we're, we're going to make a lap during the uh, commercial break uh, to see who's on Radio Row, and then we'll wrap things up from Super Bowl 56 Tuesday edition and uh, give you a preview, a glimpse of the loaded guest list for Wednesday as well. That's all straight ahead on OutKick 360.
Glad you're with us. Tuesday edition from Radio Row at Super Bowl 56 in Los Angeles for OutKick 360 across the OutKick network. Joe Burrow with some sound advice for young athletes. And, you know, you can look at this multiple ways, young quarterbacks, young athletes, anyone uh, up and coming, Jeff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Paul, you and I were talking about this earlier today. I've, I've got one quote. You've got a separate one that jumped out from media day yesterday. I, I've got this. It might be more than a day old. Focus on getting better. Don't have a workout and post it on Instagram the next day and then go sit on your butt the next day and everyone thinks you're working hard, but you're not. Work in silence. Don't show anyone what you're doing. Let your performance on Friday nights and Saturday nights and Sunday nights show all the hard work you put in. Don't worry about all that social media stuff. It's great. I think every high school coach in America is showing that to his kids. With this media availability with Joe Burrow, it showed exactly why everyone just raves about Joe Burrow uh, and his confidence. Armando Salguero from OutKick wrote about the superpower of Joe Burrow is a confidence that's unlike most athletes uh, in how he carries himself, how he thinks about the game. Uh, One great illustration of this was when he was at LSU – he won the Heisman, and there's a few weeks getting ready for a playoff and national championship game. And in the build-up to the national championship game, an LSU beat writer went up to him with a picture of Joe Burrow as an 8-year-old looking like Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. And he said, could you ever imagine this was one day going to be the Heisman Trophy winner? He said, does this look like a Heisman Trophy winner to you? And he kind of pressed Joe Burrow, didn't answer at first, and his answer finally was, looks like a national champion to me. This was six days before they won the national championship. That's Joe Burrow. A great story from Armando with that. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's incredible to watch him and hear stories about this incredible confidence that he has. And he hasn't been a superstar during these playoffs. He just hasn't made the big mistake. And when a play, when they need a play, I think about the plays he made with his legs against Kansas City to pick up two key first downs in that fourth quarter. That's where he's really shown. He had five carries for 25 yards against Kansas City, and they were big, big yards and big runs uh, for, that, for that Bengals offense, and an offense that has been struggling to find some consistency in the ground game. He's been the one providing it. I, I feel certain he's going to make plays on Sunday. I really do. And uh, I would, among all the things that would surprise me out of this game, if he posted a dud, I'd be really surprised. See, I think I think both quarterbacks will be making some outstanding. I, I, I see more of a shootout style game than I do low scoring. Yeah, I don't expect uh, particularly low scoring either. And I'd I'd be surprised. I'd be less surprised if Stafford. I, I I expect both quarterbacks to play well, but quarterback wise, I'd be less surprised if Stafford was bad. Well, but the thing that I'm sure of with Joe Burrow, which is a great. It's a really good trait for a quarterback. It can also rarely backfire, occasionally backfire. Uh, but going back to the, the playoff game we watched with Joe Burrow participated in against the Titans, Ryan Tannehill throws the first play of the game, an interception. Immediately everyone watching the game knows, well, he's done. This is not going to end well for him. He's not going to have a good day. Titans will have to win in spite of him at this point. Joe Burrow throws an interception, throws two. I don't think it phases the guy. Now the flip side of that was Brett Favre was very good at this and having a confidence like that. And at times that would get him in trouble not remembering bad plays because of his short memory during a game when he made a mistake. But with Joe Burrow, I watch him and I think, well, if he, as a young player, if he goes in this Super Bowl in a big moment and makes a mistake, you know, throws it into double coverage, it's an early interception, I don't think it's going to affect him the rest of the game. He may not play well, but it's not going to be mentally because he made that one mistake. Yeah, and I mean, he got sacked nine times in that Titans game, so it's not like something you can forget and put behind you like an interception. That onslaught kept coming, and it, it, he was unflappable out of that even. I mean, I, I don't want to overdo it with like him being so distinctive because we've talked about all of these quarterbacks. There are a lot of good ones. It could be Josh Allen here, you know, pr- pretty easily. Um, well, there's not a lot like his mind. Josh Allen is one of them. Patrick Mahomes, of course, uh, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Bray. There, there are quarterbacks that that are ele- able to elevate the players around them. And he's one, no of, matter yeah. the circumstance, and immediately just be dropped in and do it. And he's absolutely one of them. And it's one of the few. 
I mean, there, there are good quarterbacks across the league, and then there are the elite group. And he's among them when you start to watch what he's done with this Bengals group. Well, I agree. I was just saying I, I don't want to make him uh, out to be a singular guy yet. It, it could yeah, be. There's, well, but, there's, there's but, a group of guys yeah, he's throughout in the, the history of the game that's, that's that way. Yeah. That's that, that's got that, that possesses and that quality. And he's in the current group. And, and yeah. Zach Taylor said it very well with the media where he talked about Joe Burrow has this uncanny ability to make everyone around him believe. It's not just his confidence that shines through. It's as a leader, he can make you believe that the crazy play can happen, that you can go out and do something. And that's one of his, the powers that he has on that team is that everyone around him suddenly feels like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to go win this game. This, this is going to happen. Oh, I'm going to make the play when I need to make it. Even if you don't have a lot of evidence before that that it's happened, he's going to make you believe it's going to happen. And Evan McPherson gives a lot of evidence that uh, he has made it happen, but he's got that uh, swagger from the kicker position the same way. No doubt about it. And that rubs off. You know, you've got Chase who brings it, and then you have Higgins who's starting to develop that mentality, and they already have Boyd who's been there and has made some big, big catches for them even prior to – to uh, to Burrow being there, it's just it's crazy. You know, the rich get richer and wealthy uh, at Ohio State. I keep thinking, like, how did Burrow not play there? And then you look at those quarterbacks that they had year after year, J.T. Barrett and Dwayne Haskins and others, and that ultimately led Burrow down south to Baton Rouge. You know, it's crazy that the guy that has that type of moxie and mentality doesn't break through for the Buckeyes quarterback. Well, and Jamar Chase even said when he Ohio got guy. to LSU, he didn't have the job immediately and no one thought of him as this overly confident guy right. when he wasn't going to be the starter but then they started to slowly see it in practice and he said really it was the success he had that he wasn't always that way but when he started having success at LSU you could see that confidence building in the huddle game by game when they were winning and he was having success you could see it growing on uh, the Wednesday show Demario Davis from the New Orleans Saints will be on Ed McCaffrey a uh, longtime Broncos wideout, uh, Christian's father. We will uh, chat a lot with him tomorrow on the show. Uh, plus Jake Plummer, Armando Salguero, uh, and much more. Marlon Humphrey from uh, the Ravens, for instance, on the show. Hope you'll join us for Radio Row Wednesday edition tomorrow on Outkick 360. Don't block the box, do lock the locks.